Thank you, Mayor. We have our devices rolling and the floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening. This is the City of Morro Bay City Council meeting. Um, this is a regular meeting. It is Tuesday, June the 14th, 2022, 5.30 p.m. This meeting is being held via teleconference pursuant to Assembly Bill 361 uh, and Government Code Section 54953. This meeting will be conducted telephonically through Zoom. Uh, ways to participate, to watch and submit public comment for the meeting will be provided by the clerk um, at the time of public comment. You can either join via the link or you certainly can call in using your phone. Be sure to use star nine to raise your hand and be recognized for public comment. And with that, I'll ask the clerk to establish a quorum, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Addis? Here. Council Member Ford? Here. Council Member Heller? Here. Council Member Barton? Here. And Mayor Heading? Present. Thank you. We do have a quorum this evening. And if we could start um, in our own way, <clears throat> remembering those in need, uh, not only in our community, um, in our state, but across the country and world, um, in your own way, I'll just ask that we take a moment of silence for your recognition of those in need. Thank you. And thank you for that. Welcome back. Um, and uh, if we can bring up our flag, we'll go ahead and stand and uh, do the Pledge of Allegiance, please. <clears throat> Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And uh, ask our city attorney, Mr. Newmeyer, do we have a closed session report, sir, this evening? Good evening, Mr. Mayor. No closed session items to report tonight. Fantastic. I will make one note. Uh, item B-1 on our agenda this evening will be continued to June 28th, date certain June 28th during the regular meeting. This was announced um, as a public meeting where the public would be present. We do plan to be present at that time. Thusly, this is a Zoom meeting and uh, doesn't qualify for the public hearing. So I just wanted to make that note. Uh, we'll be moving item B1 to be continued to 628 date certain. And we'll go ahead and start with council member reports. Council member Heller, sir, would you like to start us off this evening? Uh, sure, thank you, Mayor. Uh, a few things that are coming up here a week from today at 21st at 4 p.m. I see a Vistra scoping meeting. Uh, I'm assuming this is a Zoom meeting, but I'm not sure. But for those of you interested in the Vistra project, that will be next Tuesday at 4 p.m. Check the city website for details on that. Uh, a week from Saturday on the 25th, the Morro Bay Maritime Museum will be hosting a marine swap meet from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. For those of you who like all kinds of marine fishing anchors, all kinds of things like that, it's a fun swap meet, uh, good for the family, uh, and just lots of fun. That's 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. on the 25th at the site of the Maritime Museum, the Triangle parking lot there. And then on the 28th, uh, as noted by the mayor, that is the deadline for those of you who are opposing the Prop 218 uh, rate increase for your trash hauling rates. That's the deadline to submit your letter of protest. I think it's 5 p.m. on the 28th prior to the public public hearing, which the mayor just referenced. Uh, those are my announcements. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Heller and Council Member Addis, please. Any announcements? Thank you, Mayor. Um, my one announcement is I got to participate as did, I think the rest of Council in Hunger Awareness Day 
earlier in June and just want to um, say how proud I was that our city manager and um, fire chief and police, and I think we had 100% attendance from council members throughout the day, and it was such a pleasure to be able to join with the um, Slow Food Bank and making a change for folks across the Central Coast that are dealing with food insecurity. And I was proud of this community as well as our whole, um, our whole county, really, and the work of the Slow Food Bank. It's a great day it was. Thank you. Council Member Ford, any announcements this evening? Thank you, Mayor. Um, the only announcement that I have is to congratulate the graduates um, that uh, this last week there were quite a few from, you know, we've had Cal Poly, we had high schools, we've had, um, you know, just quite a few graduations. So congrats to everyone. And I actually, I, I, I'm wrong. I do have one other <laughs> announcement. Um, I wanted to let um, people know that the mayor and myself attended the Boehm California Intergovernmental Renewable Energy Task Force meeting um, recently, and we were able to provide input um, to Boehm again um, when it comes to the lease, uh, the the way that they conduct the leases, and um, and it was a really great event to attend. There were over, I believe, over three hundred attendees, quite a few from our area, and um, there's a lot of great input. Um, and um, I just wanted our community to know that we're, we're still engaged in this um, opportunity that's presented itself and, uh, and we're definitely letting Boehm know the needs of our community and our, especially our fisher, uh, fishing community. Um, so I just wanted to, to, to mention that. So, and the mayor, um, can, you may have the email address. I was trying to find it and um, for public to continue to give input for the next, uh, I believe we're probably at a little over 40 days at this point for input from the community um, on that process. Um, during your announcements, if you have that email address, that'd be great. If not, I can find it. Great, thanks for that announcement and congratulations to your daughter for her high school graduation as well, Council Member Ford. And uh, Council... You bet. Council Member Barton, please. Um, <clears throat> I would like to say congratulations to our two um, uh, council members who just recently completed their um, elections. And um, I just wanted to, to thank them both for taking that, taking that on and um, nice, nice to continue working with you. Um, I am currently, um, I don't have a whole lot of announcements to make. I, um, one of my sons um, injured himself. And so I'm doing mom duty um, for a week or so. And uh, his stitches came out today. So it's, it's moving along. So <laughs> they, they never quite need uh, end and needing you to come and check it out and kind of keep them, keep them lifted up. So it was, it's nice. Great, you're right. They never do stop needing you, do they? <laughs> that's that's great, and that's a good thing. Um, and uh, with that, um, the link to Boehm is simply boehm.gov, B-O-E-M dot G-O-V. And thank you, Council Member Ford, for mentioning our attendance at the Interagency Task Force. This was the fifth meeting of the task force. Um, it was a meeting to <clears throat> go over the um, bid process, um, which should occur um, sometime um, probably um, in August or September. There are 23 different companies that have uh, been qualified for the bidding process, which is very similar to what you would bid an item like on eBay. Um, it's usually a 24-hour process where um, the three sites that are actually being bid upon uh, called the, the Morro Bay call areas. We'll go each one by one and the bidders will be able to bid. And at the end of the time of bidding, the highest bidder wins. And um, those, those leases um, that have occurred recently have gone uh, close to um, 900 million to over a billion dollars per lease site just mm -hmm. to acquire the rights to do that site. 
Um, thank you, Councilmember Ford, for mentioning the comment period. Public comment period is still open on the leasing process uh, for the uh, next 60 days or so. But again, if you go to boem.gov, you can get the exact information and the link to um, um, offering up any public comment that you may want to offer for that. And so um, with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Collins. Any announcements, sir? Yes, thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Just really briefly, um, City Council did review the city uh, proposed fiscal year 22-23 budget on May 24th and May 25th. And we'll be bringing back um, the final budget for review at the June 28th, 2022 Council meeting. And that's all I have at this point. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Scott. I appreciate that. That brings us to our um, presentations this evening. And um, Heather, if you could um, promote um, a Billy Pierce, if he's with us this evening, um, for our first proclamation. Um, I do see him um, in the queue. OK. So he is here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Billy. Um, unfortunate circumstances, but we wanted to make sure that we had the opportunity as a city um, to recognize um, the great dedication and service of your dad, um, William Bill Pierce, to the city. And um, part of our agenda this evening is a proclamation that we would like to present to you virtually, but of course we do have the actual proclamation um, that will be available at City Hall for you. Um, we were saddened by the news uh, at the loss of your dad. Um, and I want to just take this opportunity on the part of the City Council to um, read the proclamation to you. Um, this is a proclamation of the City Council of the City of Morro Bay, expressing appreciation for the dedication and public service of William Bill Pierce. And it reads as follows, whereas the City of Morro Bay has learned with profound sorrow of the death of William Bill Pierce, former uh, city member, council member for the City of Morro Bay, and whereas Bill Pierce served as a city council member for the city of Morro Bay from December of 1996 through December of 2004, and whereas Bill generously donated his time and talents to make Morro Bay a special place to live and volunteered by serving as a Rotarian since 2009 and served as president and treasurer of the Rotary Club for many years. And whereas Bill was the communications consultant at Coastal Electronics for 22 years, and whereas Bill was named Morro Bay Citizen of the Year in 2008, whereas Bill was recognized for his exceptional service to the Rotary Club of Morro Bay and Morro Bay itself, and whereas Bill was a Paul Harris, Harris recipient and Dan Riddell Humanitarian Award recipient, and Bill was an active volunteer with the Morro Bay Police Department. And whereas Bill served as the Morro Bay Police Department's volunteer president. And whereas Bill was a member advocate for the Morro Bay Police Department's Neighborhood Watch and National Night Out program and Caroling with Cops, an annual event. And whereas Bill served as president of the Morro Bay Merchants Association. And whereas Bill will be remembered by the city and community for his kindness, dedication, and for all of his um, accomplishments. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Morro Bay City Council does hereby thank William Bill Pierce for his dedicated service to the city of Morro Bay and the community. And we extend our sincere sympathy to you, Bill, and the remainder of your family and his many friends in the community during this uh, difficult time of loss. Um, you know, there wasn't a time when um, your dad didn't have a smile on his face that was um, kind of piercing, no, no pun intended, but indeed it was. And I recall one time um, as a Rotarian, the, the long bike ride that you made um, on the Rotary bike ride to, to Monterey, and your dad was there at all the stations uh, checking you out to make sure that you were doing doing what you needed to do in that, that race. And um, he was proud of you. And we, uh, as a community, are so proud of um, all the time that he gave. Um, just look at the number of different areas that he served, not only in setting policy for the, the community as a city council member, 
uh, his many years of volunteer service to our police department, um, to our youth, to a Rotary Club, always giving back um, to our community. And, and we are saddened um, at the loss of your dad, but know that he will be remembered for, for, for a very long time. And we just want to express our gratitude and thanks for sharing him with us. Um, Bill did, and Bill, you don't have to, but if you'd like to say a few words, we'd be, be happy to allow you to do that. Uh, thank you very much for, for issuing this proclamation. I really appreciate it. I'm sure he would have as well. Uh, my dad really loved the city and all of the things he did, including his time on the council, was really just to try to make Morro Bay a better place and to kind of perpetuated into the future because um, he, he kind of found the community special. So thank you again. You bet. And thanks for being here tonight. And please extend um, our ha heartfelt uh, sorrow for, for your dad's loss to the rest of your family. Thank I will. You. Thank you. And that brings us to our second proclamation. And um, Heather, if we could um, promote, uh, I don't know if Stephen and both Cheryl Vines are here. Um, um, I do not see them at this point. Okay. Um, if you do see them, feel free to promote them. But this okay. is um, um, item um, A8. This is a presentation to um, the uh, San Luis Obispo NAACP. Um, it's a proclamation of the City Council of the City of Morro Bay uh, proclaiming Saturday, June 18th, 2022 as Juneteenth Day in the City of Morro Bay. And it reads as follows, whereas since 1865, the American celebration known as Juneteenth was historically, uh, excuse me, has been historically uh, observed as the end of the institution of slavery in our great nation. And whereas Juneteenth embodies the indomitable human spirit of the past, the present, and all time. And whereas the celebration of Juneteenth gives us all the opportunity to rededicate ourselves to the true American spirit for a more perfect union. And whereas we are citizens who wish to secure the blessings of freedom, justice, equality for all this great country of ours. And whereas the collaboration of community-based organizations, faith-based organizations, local businesses, and local government demonstrates a shared commitment to being part of the solution and acknowledging the importance of strength through unity. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of the City of Morro Bay is proclaiming the third Saturday in June as Juneteenth Day and recommends all citizens of the City of Morro Bay to join in recognizing the importance of this day. Um, and that is signed by myself for the City Council. And um, we're, we're proud to be able to recognize that and honor that special day in, in our community um, this year again. So thank you for that. That ends our presentations for this evening. And I'll go ahead and move us to um, public comment. This is general public comment for items that are not on the agenda that you'd like to speak to regarding our city or for items that are on the agenda for which you cannot stay and comment on at a later time when they come up on the agenda. You can access uh, public comment two ways uh, via the link noted on the screen and or um, by calling the telephone number on the screen and be sure that if you do you use star nine to raise your hand you'll be recognized and promoted to be able to make your public comment you do have three minutes for public comment again this is general public comment um, for the city council of Moore Bay and Heather um, do we have any public or I should say Anthony do we have any public comment uh, thank you, Mayor. Currently, I see one raised hand. Don Beatty. I don't okay. know if I pronounced the last name right there, but uh, you are unmuted, Don. Welcome, Don. Are you there? Don, can you hear us? Uh, she has her microphone, or he has her microphone on or off, and uh, currently, 
yeah, uh, maybe we can move on to the next one, Mayor. Okay. Yeah, and we'll come back to Dawn if she does get in. Um, no problem. Go ahead. Copy next that. Next public comment. Please stand by. Linda Winters, you are next with your hand raised. Welcome, Linda. I have unmuted you. Thank you. Um, hi to all of the staff and Mayor Heading and everybody that got out and voted. I, I want to congratulate each and every one of you for making a good show of it. Um, I hope that your candidate of choice made it to the next level. Um, I, I also wanted to comment about something that I had mentioned um, in, the, in one of my last public comments about a particular person that said they would rather have a stick in the eye than attend a city council meeting. Well, apparently these Zoom meetings are, are what they are particularly enjoying. But I did run into that person in a couple of other events and up to and including the election. So apparently stick in the eye only wants to not be at city council meetings. Um, they were out there uh, attending a lot of other events. I also want to thank the San Luis Food Bank, uh, appreciate them including me into um, their, their hunger awareness situation. They invited me to go to the various different mobile home parks and invite people to come and see what they are eligible for. I can't tell you how much it means to the people who are living in the parks that know that there are places where they can receive benefits um, and um, live a health, healthier and happier life. It was really, really wonderful to be able to get out there and speak with all of them. And I did um, go to the city park and thank you to Chief McCrane for um, making those collections. I didn't get to see any of the other city council people, but I did um, did really respond or hope that um, the city responded well to all of that. And I hope that in the very near future, we will have in-person meetings again. Uh, that's all for now. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Um, Highland, next public comment, or Anthony, I mean, sorry. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mayor. I do not see any raised hands left in the queue. Um, would you like me to try uh, Don one more time? Sure. Please stand by. Okay, Don, you are unmuted. It was an accident of me hitting the raised hand. I have nothing to comment on. Okay, thank you, Don. Sorry. No worries. Um, is there any other public comment, Anthony? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Currently, I do not see any raised hands left in the queue. Okay. We'll go ahead and close public comment. And then I will move us to um, um, item A, which is the consent agenda. And um, uh, I will um, go ahead and uh, ask uh, Mr. Collins, did you have one item that you wanted to pull? Yes, Mayor. A clerical error correction for item A6. Um, so if, if there are other items, uh, that's great too, but I just want to flag that. Um, Make that note. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So this is public comment for the consent agenda. Uh, public comment is now open for items A1 through A6 this evening, our consent agenda. And um, go ahead and open up public comment. And Anthony, any public comments, sir? Oh, thank you, Mayor. Currently, I do not see any raised hands in the queue. Okay, I will close public comment, bring it back to the council, and ask if there are any items. Or in fact, I'll take yours first, Mr. Collins. Um, A6, I'll go ahead and pull that one. Um, you had a quick correction. Yes, on uh, page 193 of the agenda packet for item A6, um, it's you know pretty much could have been done administratively, but just you know, wanted to be super careful that this is a building permit technician one new classification position. And under uh, physical demands, uh, we are just changing the fact that the employee must occasionally lift and move up to 15 pounds. It was it was stated at 10, so that was just a, an error. Um, so out of abundance of caution, we'd like to make that note here um, so that we can correct that after the meeting. So noted. Thank but you. But non non-substantive change. But just wanted to flag that. Thank you. 
Appreciate that. Um, any other items to pull, Council? If not, I would. Uh, like to... Oh yes, Councilmember Heller. Yeah, Mayor, I'd like to pull A three and A five. Okay. A three, A five. Any others? If not, I will take a motion to approve A1, A2, A4, and A6 with the correction noted by Mr. Collins and A7 and A8. I'll move to approve. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. A motion by Councilmember Add, a second by Councilmember Barton to approve um, all but um, A5 and A3. Any further discussion? If not, Heather, if we could do a roll call vote, please. <clears throat> Councilmember Addis? Yes. Councilmember Ford? Yes. Councilmember Heller? Yes. Councilmember Barton? Yes. And Mayor Heading? Yes. That passes 5 0. Great. Councilmember Heller, A3, sir. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. Uh, regarding, regarding A3, as I understand it, we have an agreement with Vestra to have our expenses with respect to planning reimbursed by them. Uh, my understanding was that that primarily would pertain to staff expenses. And I'm wondering why we're uh, putting out city funds to uh, uh, contract RINCON consultants when in fact it seems like Vistra should be able to do that on their own. So I just uh, was curious about that. Good question, Council Member Heller. Um, we're not expending any city funds on this. We have a uh, reimbursement agreement with Vistra that pays not only for the consultant costs for the project, but also for all staff costs, including city attorney's costs. Okay, so we're not actually putting out money at all on this. It'll all come directly from uh, Vistra when they invoice us? That it, it comes, well, the money's given to us and then we pay the invoices um, and uh, and we um, we track our time, and city attorney obviously tracks his time, and uh, they pay for all of those services as well. Okay, and then the selection of RINCON consultants was there an RFP for that, or is this uh, was a professional services agreement that the city felt was appropriate for this project, or can you explain the basis for awarding it to them? Um, yes, we did go out um, uh, with uh, a request to to get some proposals uh, in the beginning of the process. Um, the uh, Rincon was also the uh, EIR consultant for the city's general plan, local coastal land use plan. Um, so had the most familiarity. And so when we got proposals back, we sat down with the applicant and reviewed the proposals. And um, both the applicant and the city agreed that Rincon, having worked most recently with the city, was the most qualified to take the project on. And that's why Rincon was chosen. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, the, the, I guess the last question about that is, do we, uh, we don't typically hire uh, environmental consultants on behalf of applicants, do we? Or is that what we normally do? Um, so it, it depends what you mean by that, Councilmember Heller, but um, sometimes projects come forward and they will bring studies from their environmental consultants forward. Sometimes we peer review those. Um, and sometimes we have the consultant um, perform the environmental analysis or again perform peer reviews it just kind of depends um, the we kind of divided the duties here we had uh, Vistra provide us some studies and then we met with the Vistra team and it was agreed that uh, moving forward that uh, that Rincon would complete some of the some of the additional studies that were necessary once the project expanded to include the uh, demolition of the plant and the stacks and mm -hmm. that uh, Vista would complete some of the studies or expand those studies with their consultants um, as well. So it was kind of a, a division of duties, if you will, um, as part of the is, is is why the contracts were were amended the way that they were. Okay, thank you for that, Scott. Appreciate the explanation. Sure. Uh, uh, did you want to move approval, um, Councilor? Um, yeah. Should we talk about five first, or do you want to take them each individually and then I? If you don't okay. Want to, yeah. Sure. I thank move you, approval you. of uh, consent agenda item A three. Okay, I'll second that. Um, any further discussion? Okay, Heather, we have a roll call on item A3. Roll call Council, vote. Council Member Addis? Yes. Council Member Ford? Yes. Council Member Heller? Yes. Council Member Barton? Yes. And Mayor Heading? Yes. This passes 5 0. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Heller, A5, please. Yes. 
So this is regarding obviously the continuance uh, of having uh, meetings remotely. And believe it or not, I'm not sure why, but we have a very devoted following of people who like to come to our meetings, which <laughs> is a good thing, but I'm always surprised that people do that when there's so many other good things to do. But I'm wondering what is driving uh, this need. It, uh, it's, uh, you know, we got some correspondence on this. When there are other in-person meetings, I think that most of us attend it's, uh, various city events. So I'm wondering why uh, we can't have open meetings uh, at this point is in, rather than uh, extending it for another 30 days. Scott, did you want to take that or? Sure, yeah, the, and Chris can cover the, the basis for a, a, Assembly Bill 861. Um, a, 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 AB 861 doesn't necessarily mean that all meetings will be virtual, but it does allow uh, for that to occur, but also for, for, for hybrid and for situations where you know, individual council members or the mayor may not be able to uh, participate in person because of, of illness. Um, so you could still carry forward, carry on with a, an in-person meeting, uh, but one individual or a couple individuals on the council could participate remotely <coughs> out of health and safety concerns. So by extending this resolution, you, you wouldn't necessarily be saying all meetings will be held virtually only. Um, it just provides flexibility. In the case uh, where why we're we're currently um, remote right now is that we had an outbreak at, at the city, um, and it stemmed from previous public meetings. And so, out of abundance of caution, we felt it was necessary to, at least for this meeting uh, and the prior one, do it remotely. So AB three sixty one just allows for that flexibility if things occur that would trigger that need. But ultimately our, our intent is to go back into person and still have the flexibility for individual council members to uh, participate remotely if they're ill. Okay, and then do you, I know you can't predict the future, but do you anticipate if things continue the way they are that the meeting on the 28th, which is the public hearing for the Prop 218, will that be an in-person meeting you think? Yes, sir, I, I do believe so. And, and in order to conduct the public hearing, by the way it was noticed, it would need to be in person. And we can require face masks or whatever else we want in terms of seating arrangements and so forth, can't we? No, um, as of now, there's no federal or state or county requirement for masking. You certainly, just like any uh, um, facility you can encourage, strongly encourage, uh, recommend, but you cannot require at this time. Okay, uh, thank you for that clarification. No problem. Like to move approval of consent item A5. I'll second that. Any further discussion? And Heather, roll call vote, please. Councilmember Addis? Yes. Councilmember Ford? Yes. Councilmember Heller? Yes. Councilmember Barton? Yes. And Mayor Heading? Yes. Passes 5 0. Okay. Get situated here. And that brings us to item. Uh, with me here. Thank you. <clears throat> Item B-2. Again, B-1 is moved to June 28th, live meeting. B-2 is a request for amendment to the land use map within the general plan, local coastal plan, adopted in 2021 and receipt and filing of an addendum to the related environmental impact report. The change from district commercial to community commercial is consistent with the proposed new zoning designation for the site, the site is adjacent to similarly designated sites along Main Street. This is a public hearing. We'll, um, <clears throat> from a process standpoint, <clears throat> excuse me, we will receive our staff report, have uh, council questions and answers. Then I'll open the public hearing, um, ask for general public comment, allow the applicant to comment as well. Um, when we're completed that, I'll close public comment, close the public hearing and then bring it back to council for discussion and uh, recommendation. So with that, welcome Nancy Hubbard, our contract planner, um, and Thank turning you. it over to you, ma'am. All right, here we go. I'm going to share my screen. OK, is everyone seeing a presentation? Yeah, can you make it a little bigger, Nancy? PowerPoint or I can't see what you can see. Okay, a slideshow. And um, that should help. How about that? There you go. Perfect. Okay. 
Perfect. All right, so this is, um, as you mentioned, a public hearing to consider land use amendment for the property located at 1260 Main Street. And I just have to figure out how to get the slide to advance. Ah, there we go. Um, so the request, um, this shows with the little yellow star and the arrow pointing towards it. It is the um, last property on Main Street before the elevation changes as it goes down to Quintana. And the request is to change the land use map in the general plan local coastal program, which was adopted in 2021 from district commercial to community commercial. So a little information about the site, you probably all recognize the photo. It was um, a miniature and collectible item retail store. The site is just under 15,000 square feet and it's wedge shaped with access for, uh, from Main Street. The existing building is about 1400 square feet and dates back to 1952. So the process uh, for land use map amendment includes an environmental review, which was performed uh, via an ad addendum to the 2021 EIR, and it resulted in a finding uh, in a findings of no significant environmental impacts. Uh, public hearing by Planning Commission, uh, which has been held and they forwarded a recommendation to City Council, public hearing, which is what we're doing tonight with City Council, and if approved, this will then go for review and certification by the California Coastal Commission. It will likely be packaged with other land use amendments since we're limited to three requests per year. This shows you the parcel and the photo is showing you kind of the elevation change between the site and its surrounding district commercial uses along Quintana. Um, and this shows the streets uh, looking north on Main Street, the Masterpiece Hotel. This site is just beyond that. The uh, applicant and the owner is the owner of the Masterpiece Hotel, and they um, plan to do some hotel uses in, on that property. Um, the support for the um, change in the land use is that it has a connectivity, probably a stronger connectivity with the commercial community commercial that's along Main Street. It also has the same elevation, the same access. Um, it would be a continuation of the walkable uh, shops, restaurants, hotels, beach access. And Maine is not as much heavy truck traffic area as Quintana is. So it seems more suitable for community commercial. This is just a visual to show you the adjacency to the community commercial along Main Street. And then um, what it currently is, is district commercial with that large geographic boundary uh, barrier between the elevation changes. And this shows what the change would do is just move the line for community commercial to encompass that property. And that concludes the presentation and staff recommends the city council approve the land use amendment request by adopting resolution 47-22, which includes finding for MAJ 21-006. And the property owner, Steve Allen, is in the uh, queue for participants. Thank you, Nancy. Appreciate the presentation. and. Um... I don't know how you did it, but <clears throat> everything you spoke was in writing at the bottom of the slide. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> able to hear and see everything you said. So um, thanks again for the overview of that um, fairly clear and consistent. Um, I'll just ask if there are council questions at this time before we go to public comment. Looking for any hands, not seeing any. Give it a sec. Okay. Seeing that there are no questions from council, I'll go ahead and open up the public hearing um, and open up general public comment. This is public comment for item B-2, our public hearing item this evening. Um, public comment is available now for that item. And um, Anthony, do we have any public comment, sir? All right, thank you, Mayor. Currently, I do not see, oh, 
I see Stephen Allen with his hand raised. Okay. Okay, Stephen, I have unmuted you. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you, Mayor Heading. Can you hear me? Yes, just fine. Perfect. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, council members. Just wanted to add very quickly, we've been working on the project for about a year now. Um, the cottage shop was on the market. It was some real nice folks that, um, you know, they lived on the site and they had the collectible store. Uh, it made sense for us. You know, we're not looking to um, really develop anything. If possible, we want to keep the same footprint as the building that's there. It would ideally be two hotel rooms and then a small apartment for our on-site employee manager. And there is quite a bit of parking there um, that would you know, benefit this site and then the main hotel as well. So very simple project. And we just liked it because it was next to the hotel. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate it. Um, Anthony, uh, other public comment? Uh, thank you, Mayor Heading. Currently, I do not see any raised hands left in the queue. All right, I'll go ahead and close public comment, close the public hearing, and I will bring it back to the council members um, for um, either a motion or any questions. Council Member Addis, yes, please. I just have a quick question for Mr. Allen, if possible. Sure, absolutely. If uh, I was just wondering if um, housing is currently provided for the hotel manager or if this would be new housing that's offered uh, to somebody who's working in Morro Bay? Sure, good question, thank you. Um, we currently have an on-site staying at the property now just for lack of a better use and we're using about half the building for commercial storage. And then, and so the idea is to convert to two more hotel rooms and maintain the housing. Correct, yes. Okay, got it, thank you. Question, thank you. Um, other council um, comments or discussion? I have a comment if I could, Mayor. Yes, please, <laughs> Councilor Helen. Yeah, uh, I'd like to thank the Planning Commission for their work on this and their review of this issue. To me, as it's explained and presented, it's the perfect use of a land use amendment and I, I support the change. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'll, my comment will be um, absolutely ditto. Um, I couldn't have said it any better and um, appreciate the, the questions regarding housing. Uh, so critically important for our worker worker staff here in Morro Bay. And um, I'm just pleased to see that there'll be accommodations for that. Um, so I, I too will be supporting the item. Any further comments? Councilmember Ford, please. Just that I want to echo everyone's comments, and I'm excited <laughs> when any employer provides workforce housing. So that's great. It was good to hear. Good information. So, yeah, I also support this right. as well. Okay. All right. With that, I'll go ahead and make a motion to adopt resolution number 47 22, approving the MAJ 21. Dash 006 for a change in the land use map included in the general plan, local coastal plan program, land use plan from district commercial to community commercial for this parcel, and uh, number two, to receive and file the addendum. I'll second the motion. All right, motion by Mayor Heading for staff recommendation, second by Council Member Heller. Any further comments? If not, I will ask Heather for another roll call vote, please. Council Member Addis? Yes. Council Member Ford? Yes. Council Member Heller? Yes. Council Member Barton? Yes. And Mayor Heading? Yes. That passes <clears throat> by zero. Okay, thank you. That ends that item and our public um, hearings for this evening uh, moves us to our business items. This is item C-1, <clears throat> preparedness uh, and operational readiness related to Morro Bay Police Department response to critical incidents, including um, active shooter related issues. Um, we, uh, through majority support, um, agendized this at our last meeting, um, given the um, Uvalde shooting uh, that had, had occurred in Texas I had the opportunity to meet with our uh, police chief uh, commander and our SRO 
um, and also had the opportunity to interact with the school district. And, and this evening, um, our staff and the school district is here to present information on readiness and response, as well as uh, school related uh, safety issues, training, education, etc. So with that, I believe I'm going to be turning it over to Chief Cox to begin with. Chief, thank you. Yes, thank you, Mayor, uh, Mayor Heading and, and Council. Uh, again, as Mayor stated, this, is, uh, this item is related to emergency preparedness and operational readiness uh, related not only to critical incidents, but even specifically to uh, active shooter situations. So a, a little background, uh, as Mayor Heading mentioned, you know, this was brought up at the last uh, Council meeting. And considering some of the recent uh, critical incidents and shooting incidents that have occurred throughout uh, San Luis Obispo County over the last couple of years, and, and more specifically, a couple of the active shooter situations that, that all of us have recently been made aware of in, in Buffalo, New York, and Uvalde, Texas, uh, Council had requested this update to examine the operational readiness of our, of our police department. Uh, Morro Bay Police Department continues to maintain some of the highest standards for training uh, that, that, that are out there to ensure that all staff is equipped and prepared to respond immediately to any critical incident, including those uh, classified as active shooter situations. The Morro Bay Police Department also maintains uh, some great relationships and partnerships with all of the surrounding law enforcement agencies within Slow County for uh, mutual aid and AOA or assist other agency responses. And this is especially important considering our geographic location and the proximity to the outside agencies that would be responding to assist us in the event of a critical incident. So a, a little about this um, process, Morro Bay, like all law enforcement agencies right now, has faced several challenges in maintaining full staffing with recent retirements and, and resignations, which have been noted in law enforcement agencies across the country. Uh, this isn't anything that is exclusive to Morro Bay uh, or Slow County for that matter. It, it's something that we're seeing across the country. One major component of operational readiness is being able to maintain, excuse me, turn that radio off, to be able to maintain adequate staffing of highly skilled and qualified personnel to respond to any critical incident at any time. And the Morro Bay Police Department continues to seek out the most qualified and capable peace officers that we can find to join our public safety team to be able to meet our department's mission of providing the best possible service we can to our community. And part of our commitment is being able to provide the highest levels of training available in the law enforcement profession and to provide the best possible equipment to keep our, part, our officers and our community safe, especially as it relates to these types of critical incidents that we're talking about tonight. And I'll just give you a quick example of some of the training components related to this. Our four current sergeants prior to bringing on the, the new sergeant that we brought on two weeks ago have all attended at least three high risk cri critical incident training courses in the past few years. With two of those four sergeants attending at least four separate courses because they're, they're identified as department instructors and range masters and they're counted on to help train the rest of our staff. <clears throat> in addition to our supervisory staff, we have also sent at least five of our current patrol officers to at least one specialized course in this topic in this past year. And three of our newer officers who have not yet had that opportunity are either on a waiting list or are uh, signed up for these courses as they become available. And again, some of these types of, of tactical courses are not always readily available here locally. So you have to be able to find the courses and get your staff into those courses when they do become available. Now, the courses that I'm talking about are directly related to critical incident and active shooter responses, and they do not include the myriad of additional training courses that our officers take each year related to their other job duties and activities. And the objective of, of this training is to be consistent and have ongoing and relevant training to enhance the level of service to the public. It's to, to increase the technical expertise and the overall effectiveness of our staff and to provide for their continued development throughout, uh, throughout all of the aspects of law enforcement that they serve in. Our training continues to exceed post standards and requirements and incorporates the highest industry standards available for law enforcement training. And, and as you can imagine, there are so many different vendors out there that are 
trying to get into the training market to be able to provide training to, to law enforcement agencies because it, it, it is big business. So we, we really seek out the best instructors in the best courses for our staff. And, and as an example of some of the training, over the past 18 months, when I, when I pulled these records up, our officers have averaged approximately 150 hours of specialized training. Now this, to keep in perspective, we have 18 sworn officers, but the, these numbers here are, are only related to 14 of these officers because two of those positions were vacant uh, and the new officer that we had recently hired had just gotten out of the academy. And this doesn't include my position as chief. So this includes 13 of those officers plus the commander position. And again, that's 150 hours on average over the last 18 months. And some of these courses are specific to critical incident response for both patrol and supervisor courses, active shooter response, threat assessment and de-escalation, rapid deployment and crisis intervention. And again, there's a whole host of other investigative and job specific courses that the officers take that are both online and in person, depending on where the class is available. We continue to work closely with our, our fire department and our other entities within the city, uh, again, in training to be able to coordinate critical re incident responses to any situation that might come up throughout the city. In addition to providing the highest levels of training, we have also invested in the equipment and resources. Chief, we're losing the um, audio. Um, can, you, can you still hear me? Can you hear me I now, can. Mayor? I can hear you fine. Okay. There you go. We can hear uh, you. Uh, okay. In addition to providing the highest levels of training, we have also invested in the equipment and the resources to allow our officers to train to respond immediately to these types of threats. With council support, we recently outfitted every officer with an active shooter response kit, which I will we'll demonstrate in a short video clip here in a moment. We have also invested in a weapon simulation system, which is basically it's an indoor range training system, which kind of allows us to, to train in additional areas uh, such as target acquisition, accuracy drills, de-escalation scenarios, and those types of things. And we can train indoors and we can take that system into other buildings and facilities to be able to train and change up that environment to allow us to train in different environments. And in addition to that, we also invested in a losing you again, sir. Can everybody else hear me? Yeah, Mayor, I think oh. it might be your your up your um, internet. We're hearing him fine. Oh, you can hear him. Yeah, I can hear. You. Okay. I don't know. Uh, in, in addition, uh, we also invested in a remote controlled robotic shooting system that allows us to train with the dynamics of a moving target as may be experienced in these type of fluid and mobile critical incident situations. We also updated and replaced uh, many of our uh, patrol rifles and shotguns to make sure that the equipment that we utilize in a critical incident is operationally ready as well. And, and I'm gonna pause right here for just a moment and ask Heather to uh, play that short video clip that will explain what exactly an active shooter kit is and how quickly it can be deployed in the field by our officers. Thank you, and Chief. Heather. I think AGP is going to administer that. Okay. Um, scrolling all the way back to the beginning. Hmm. Hello, I'm Officer Miller with the Morro Bay Police Department. In this video, we are going to review the active shooter response kits, which are issued to Morro Bay PD officers. Each officer is issued an active shooter response kit, which is contained in a rapid deployment bag. All officers keep these bags with them in their patrol vehicles throughout their shifts and can deploy them in a moment's notice. Each bag contains additional body armor and a ballistic helmet. Here we have the ballistic helmet, which is designed to protect officers from pistol rounds. The ballistic helmet comes with a set of goggles to protect the eyes of officers and gives minimal ballistic protection. Here we have the body armor, 
consisting of a plate carrier and rifle rated ballistic plates. On the plate carrier, officers have magazine pouches, body camera attachment, and a medical pouch. Each officer is issued two additional magazines for their department issued pistols and two additional magazines for their department issued rifles. The body camera attachment allows officers to quickly remove their body camera from their standard external carrier vest and rapidly attach it to the plate carrier. Here we have the medical pouch which is attached to the front of the plate carrier. The medical pouch contains the following items. Additional tourniquet, cutting shears, emergency pressure dressing, flat compression gauze, quick clot hemostatic gauze, and entry exit wound chest seal. Here we have school resource officer Gillespie demonstrating the standard department issued external carrier vest, which gives officers basic protection from handgun ammunition. Here is officer Gillespie demonstrating the department issued active shooter response kit, which gives officers additional protection from rifle ammunition in the chest area and protection from handgun ammunition on an officer's head. The following is an example of Officer Gillespie conducting a response and deployment of the active shooter response kit for demonstration purposes. Thank you, AGP. I, I, I thought it was important to share that with you. So you have an understanding of, of, of actually what the active shooter kit is and how quickly it can be deployed. And the reason I find that is important is as I review uh, many of these shooting situations across the country, uh, and especially this most recent one in Texas, one of the things that we always hear is they're waiting on people to arrive with specialty equipment and, and, and rifles and the things that uh, they either didn't have readily available in their vehicles to respond immediately to these types of situations or they're waiting on a tactically equipped officer to arrive on scene. Uh, we make it a point here to make sure that all of our officers, uh, including myself and the commander, have these kits available in our vehicles and are ready to respond at any given time. So in addition to the training and the equipment, uh, we also ha have to figure in how the law applies and how our policies apply. Uh, and that's why it's important that our officers uh, participate in what we call a daily training bulletin system here in the organization. So they're constantly in review of our policies and, and, and how they apply. So uh, all of our officers are required to know and understand policies related to these type of specific threats, such as our rapid uh, response and deployment policy, our use of force policy, and our gun violence restraining orders. And all of these policies for the police department are publicly available online. So any, anybody in our community can reach out onto our website. They can go to the city site and pull up any of these policies to be able to review them. Our entire policy manual is uh, readily available to the public. And I mentioned red flag laws, uh, so I'm going to shift gears here for just a moment. 
and, and cover that because uh, that kind of goes towards the question that we sometimes get a lot for information related to preventing these types of critical incidents before they occur by utilizing these red flag laws and helping people understand how they work. And again, this process is known as a gun violence restraining order. And this can be found in our policy uh, number 342, which is also attached to this uh, staff report for council. And simply put, California was the first in the nation to enact what is commonly referred to as a red flag law in 2014. And that law was expanded upon in January of 2020 under Assembly Bill 61 and Penal Code Sections 18100 through 18120. Uh, signed by Governor Newsom. The original version of this law allowed law enforcement and a close family member to be able to petition the court for a restraining order to remove a firearm from the possession of someone that they felt was either a threat to themselves or others. The current law that was expanded in 2020 reached out even further, and this process was to include employers, co-workers, and teachers to also be able to seek out the petition to be able to remove firearms from someone who may be considered dangerous or a possible threat. It is important to note that the law only allows these people, including law enforcement, to petition the court for the removal of firearms. And any order to remove the firearms must be approved by the judicial process in court. So the petition must be able to identify and articulate the threat. This process is known as the gun violence restraining order. And we have all of those available forms here in the organization. Should we come across somebody who is providing that information, we have the ability to complete these petitions and or provide them the forms to be able to complete the petition so that they can go through this process. Law enforcement cannot arbitrarily respond to someone's house and automatically remove a firearm simply on the basis of someone alleging that they may be may be dangerous. However, if the court does issue a gun violence restraining order, then we will participate in the process of serving that order if it's not done through the civil process, and we will respond to enforce that order to remove those firearms upon the court issuing that order. And again, this process uh, for that removal process is outlined in the policy uh, if someone would like to look at that. One of the really important things in regards to these last couple of shooting incidents is our collaboration and coordination with our, with our school. And the city of Morro Bay and the San Luis Coastal Unified School District have an agreement where the school district provides uh, the expense of a full-time police officer position to serve as a school resource officer. Now this officer is dedicated to the school full-time. He's there Monday through Friday through all school hours uh, and he's flexible for special events uh, prom dances, graduations, all of those things that take place at the school, uh, the officer is readily available for. So he doesn't typically respond and answer calls for service as the patrol officers do. He essentially is dedicated to the school full time. And in the SRO position, he maintains weekly coordination between school administration and the police administration on, on any events that are coming up or any special issues that, that might need our attention or further collaboration uh, for school safety issues. Um, I know that there's a school district representative that will be talking to you shortly uh, about the school's uh, preparation and readiness, and, and I'll let him uh, dive into that a little bit more here in a moment. But I would also like to point out that our school uh, district and the police department also partner in the RAVE mobile app, which is an emergency notification system. And it's for immediate notification of any priority incident that may occur at one of our schools. And this is an app that's downloaded on the phones of the school faculty and staff members and teachers. And then every PD officer has that app downloaded on their phone. And again, it's a great emergency notification system. If some type of incident and it doesn't have to be a critical incident needing a law enforcement response. It could need uh, a fire response or a EMS response for an, uh, an injury, but it gives immediate notification and any officer that is on duty would get that notification. Uh, and the other great thing about this system that is operated through the county at the schools countywide is that it's geofenced. So it gives a, a, an exact location of where that caller uh, is at within the school boundaries. So if they're in a specific building 
uh, we are notified of that. So when we're responding, we have that notification and we're not sitting uh, outside the perimeter of the school trying to figure out where the call is coming from. The geofencing in this system gives us the exact location of the caller. So, so it really is a great benefit uh, for, for our school system and, and for the police department to have. <clears throat> and I'll just, uh, in closing, I just want to add that, you know, our goal is that we want council and our community to know that we take great pride in being well-trained and well-equipped and prepared to face any circumstance or emergency that may arise. We work closely with the school district to ensure our SRO is uh, well-equipped and prepared and trained to respond to any incident within the school and not just any critical incident, but, but be able to assist the faculty and staff and students with any issue that may arise. Any emergency situation will have its share of challenges and it may require split second decision-making uh, in a very fluid and rapidly evolving incident. But the men and women of this agency understand the risk we face and they are committed to making sure that this community is safe. Uh, and that's why we have the training standards and, and the expectations and the accountability that, that we have. We'll always work to prevent these types of incidents from occurring, uh, but as we've seen from around the country, you can't always prevent these types of things. So what we can do is make sure that we are readily available to respond at a moment's notice with the proper tools, the resources, and the training that we need to get the job done. And with that, I'm going to uh, stop and I'll be happy to answer any questions or, or shift over to uh, Mr. Pinkerton, who is here to represent the school. Can we go ahead and have uh, uh, Ryan Pinkerton promoted and then Chief will ask questions at the end? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Mayor Heading um, and City Council members. Uh, appreciate being here tonight to uh, kind of share some of the safety procedures, policies that are um, things that we've, of course, been focused on for many years now. But in particular, I will say after the Parkland shooting um, back in 2018, uh, unfortunately, Uvalde was not the first, you know, situation like this that's happened. Um, there's been several in the past. And after the Parkland shooting in particular, our board um, really made safety, safety policies, procedures. Um, uh, it was actually a board goal for the year. So it was one of our major focus areas of redoing all of our safety planning, looking at everything, developing our relationships. And um, that was when we uh, developed the relationship with the city of Mora Bay for our SRO. And so um, the district worked together with the city, uh, getting that position going. Um, and I'm happy to say that we have an outstanding relationship with the city of Mora Bay. Um, whether it be childcare, whether it be through the SRO system, whether it be um, the, you know, the pool at Morro Bay lifeguard system, um, we really have a great relationship with the city. And so really appreciate that. Um, and, and it's helpful in these situations, right? That if something does happen, we have that relationship to, um, you know, allow law enforcement in, allow them to take over the situation. Um, and, and so those are really critical things. So I'm going to share uh, kind of a list of things that we've done um, in terms of this kind of a threat standpoint, as well as give you just a broad spectrum of safety, because honestly, the, the school shooter aspect of it is such a, it, it's a small part of overall safety planning um, and what we're trying to do to keep our kids safe um, and really our community safe, right, as, as, we, uh, as we move forward. So um, we did hire uh, Resolute and Associates uh, back in 2018. And so this, this is uh, Rob Lewin, uh, Garrett Olson. I heard the food bank, right? Um, and, and those two gentlemen started a, a business called Resolute Associates, which was really focused on kind of the safety planning. It was their first kind of, you know, jump in, dive into um, into safety and, and kind of starting this consulting business. And I got to tell you, they were absolutely fantastic. So we, we literally have five volumes of safety planning. And if you know Rob Loon and Garrett Olson, you'll know that they're very thorough, right? So, um, so we put all of that together um, and that, you know, that was, we spent a whole year with our administrators doing it. What I will tell you is that um, in March of that year, COVID happened. And literally when we were about to set up our multi-year training, um, you know, participation with school sites and parents and kids, uh, COVID, you know, shut down. The, the entire school district. And so um, it, that has been something that I will tell you probably just until maybe January of this year 
has been all encompassing for our staff and our, our teachers. So putting one more thing, safety, doing anything else besides just trying to teach kids in the classroom um, was, was something that we, I mean, we couldn't conquer. Uh, the good news is I feel like we're at a place now where we can jump back in and we can make this a, a priority again with our staff and we can reinstitute Resolute and kind of get this uh, multi-year training going. Um, that, of course, includes Alex, your, our, our SRO, uh, Officer Gillespie, um, you know, Chief Cox, right, will be part of that training and, and really looking at our plans and getting their feedback. And, um, you know, they, they, we have a great relationship with them. We've had inc incidents this year where uh, we've had a homeless person um, on, on Morro Bay campus, and um, we've been able to instantly get a hold of Officer Gillespie and, and the Morro Bay um, Police Department to assist us in that and a quick reaction time getting there. Um, we have video surveillance on campus that they've helped us with. So there's just a lot of things that we put in place. So, um, so those are kind of some, some key areas I will say um, that where the school district's working on, but I'm gonna share just a quick kind of a list of things. Um, you know, we were very fortunate as a school district that our community passed Measure, um, measure D, right? And, and the focus of Measure D was a, a school bond that was really focused on our two comprehensive of high school. So uh, completely modernizing, um, putting a lot of safety security in at both Morro Bay High School and San Luis Obispo High School. We, we're about a year away at both sites from having all of those projects completed. And so some of that in, in includes fencing around the entire campus, being able to lock down. Uh, we have video surveillance systems throughout the campus. Um, Measure D also was not just about the two comprehensive high schools. The safety really was um, kind of early on when we did this in 2018 during that, and we put in a new VoIP phone system. Um, and so that phone system basically enables anybody on campus to pick up any phone on campus um, to alert the entire school campus of an intruder, um, anything happening. Uh, it gives the office, it gives the um, 911 operator the exact location of the, the incident, so the classroom that the, the phone call was made. Um, but more importantly, it allows um, the entire campus then to lock down, right? So that, again, once a shooter's on campus, something's happened, at that point, you're trying to stop casualties. You're trying to, you know, close the situation. Um, and so that, that was something that was, was put in throughout and probably one of the, you know, the most critical um, aspects of safety that we put in with Measure D. But uh, throughout, so just here's some just general examples of things that we've done um, in the school district. So one, Again, updating our site safety plans. We do that annually. We include our SRO in those trainings and our, our planning, of course. Um, that's signed off with our parents, our school site council rep. Um, all sites do monthly drills. That includes everything from fire, earthquake, uh, lockdown drills. Um, we have bomb drills. Uh, every two years, we do our major Diablo Canyon drill, which includes um, everything from our bus drivers helping with evacuation, um, evacuation landing, loading zones. Um, to, you know, taking their little uh, nuclear pills, right, to help them should there be any type of, of threat with, you know, the plant in that way. So we have emergency flip charts in all of our classrooms, um, which is just a quick, easy thing, because oftentimes you forget about what about the substitute in class who wasn't part of the staff training. You know, it, so it's just a quick, easy, hey, if this is going on, this is what you should do. This is um, where you should go uh, in the event of an evacuation. Um, those types of things. Um, again, I talked about the phone system that's put in place. Um, we have two-way radios that we've expanded. So should the uh, internet go out, should the phone system be down, we do have our handheld radios. Um, we've expanded those throughout the sites. Um, again, your SRO has, has one as well. Um, so it definitely helps in that communication. Um, we have visitors check-in systems. Uh, in particular, Morro Bay High School, we have one where they, you know, you have to run your driver's license through. So um, it, it kind of does a background check as well. That's something we're going to expand to all of our school sites. Um, we talked about the school resource officers. We have them. And again, it, it, Officer Gillespie, though, is stationed at Morro Bay High for the most part, of course, is absolutely available to go over to Del Mar, help with any situations they have as well. Um, and, and, you know, is, is definitely an asset in that way. Um, we have lock blocks. So part of Measure D, of course, is putting interior door locks on all doors throughout our school system. So a teacher, you don't have to go outside, lock the door, and then close it. Um, so all of our new doors at, um, throughout Mor Morro Bay High School, San Luis Obispo High School, have interior door locks so the teacher can do it from inside. Um, all other doors throughout the school, 
uh, have what's called a lock block. So they can keep the outside door handle locked. They just open, click the lock block open. They can open and close the door throughout the day. And if they need to um, lock the door, you know, quickly, they can just go up, move that lock block, boom, the door shut. So we have those um, throughout all of our campuses. We've had those for years and years. Um, we do have satellite phones. So um, as part of our work with Resolute, we also uh, recently did our hazard mitigation um, plan, had that approved by FEMA. Um, and so, you know, part of that is kind of the ma major overall, you know, catastrophe um, that might happen in our area. Um, and so how we're going to handle that and have a plan for that as part of that. Um, you know, part of our, our goal, of course, as we move forward is that we have single point of entry. So again, once the Measure D work is done, anybody who enters that campus needs to go through that main office door. Um, and so, you know, that is something that is still needed at our elementary and middle school sites. Um, and, and something that, you know, after, after Measure D, after our two comprehensive high schools, um, we're going to be focused on our middle schools and elementary. Um, we have implemented a lot of video surveillance around. And this is not something where there's somebody sitting behind a camera watching, you know, everything that goes on throughout the campus. However, I will tell you, um, it has been really helpful. Uh, we have license plate readers. Um, you know, we have a lot of, unfortunately, uh, people that come onto campus, so theft, breaking in, um, those types of things. And the video surveillance has helped Officer Gillespie uh, throughout the year. You know, apprehend sub subjects. Uh, we recently, I mean, just last weekend, we had somebody um, come on campus and was throwing things in the pool and doing things. And um, we were able to, you know, get a copy, a picture of the of the, of the vehicle, license plate, um, for more of AP to follow up, PD to follow up on. Um, Chris Bonin and myself attend um, a conference each year called Safe and Sound Schools. And this is kind of where we where we first started in 2018 with Resolute. And this is, uh, it was founded by um, two parents uh, from the Sandy Hook tragedy. And so they um, wanted to, to take what happened and develop kind of this organization that could uh, promote safe policies. And, and again, what I love about Safe and Sound Schools and in particular, Michelle Gay, one of the parents, uh, the founder of Safe and Sound Schools is, it's not just about the school shooter. It's not just about that one incident that happens. It's everything that you're doing to promote safety um, and security and um, a culture of safety on your campuses. And I'm gonna share the pillars um, in a minute that, uh, that really come right from Safe and Sound Schools. Um, again, we have these comprehensive safety plans that Resolute helped us put together. This includes everything from those drills we talked about to um, like at Sandy Hook, the major issue at Sandy Hook when they had no reunification plan. What, what are we going to do to get these kids back to their parents after this incident happened? Um, and you can imagine um, that, you know, the grief that goes on in a situation like that, where you're the parent standing there with all the other parents and your, your child's not coming out. And so you have to have a plan for that. You have to be able to, uh, to do that. And I look forward to working with Chief Cox and Alex, um, Officer Gillespie, um, on that reunification plan and, and working with our staff on, on developing that. Um, and again, those have been developed. We just need to now do the actual training with staff um, now that we're kind of in a place where we can start that. Uh, we have done major threat assessment training through our school district and have threat assessment teams. So when, when there's a threat, when there's um, a notification about a particular student making a threat online or something to that effect, um, this team comes together, school psychologists, uh, district administration. Um, it can absolutely include our SRO um, and law enforcement, um, but, but they come together. They'll do a, a full assessment of the student um, you know, to ensure that the student is safe and whether the student is going to return to campus or not, all those decisions are made at that point um, and law enforcement is brought in. Um, we have increased counseling services over the course of the year. The pandemic has brought a lot of behavioral issues with kids. So returning to campus, um, and, and again, not from a Uvalde threat situation per se, but just behaviors on, on campuses, and in particular with our elementary students. So, so we are um, increasing our counseling services at all of our elementary sites. We're gonna have full-time counselors uh, next year. Uh, we had part-time counselors prior to this at our elementaries, um, and of course have counselors at our middle schools and high schools um, as well. Um, a critical thing, and, and Chief Cox talked a little bit about this, and that is we wanna know before this even happens, 
And so um, we have implemented a, an anonymous bully button, we call it, um, which is basically a way to let, let our school district know at any time, 24 hours a day, um, somebody can let us know, shoot us a, um, you know, basically information regarding any type of bullying incident, um, as well as concerns from, from citizens. So, I mean, we've, we've had everything from flooding in a, a school building um, to, you know, your basic bullying situation that might happen on a school bus or, or with students. And um, it's nice. I'm actually the person 24 seven that receives those. And then I can instantly, again, if I need to call 911, if I need to uh, alert a school administration, um, talk to a teacher, those types of things, uh, alert, call a family, talk to them, um, we, we were able to do that. And so that has been a real positive thing, I think, um, and, and something that's really good. We recently uh, joined the city of San Luis Obispo. They, we did a simulation um, drill, and I look forward to working with, with Chief Cox on doing something similar with the city of Morro Bay. Um, and so it was a simulation that actually Resolute put together. I think your former uh, fire chief, um, Chief Knuckles, was is now part of Resolute and helped with that. But it was a they did a simulation where a, it was a, a fake you know plane uh, crashed at uh, the Laguna Lake area, and you know kind of a joint effort. And what would we do at that point, right? You know, basically handing it off to the city, the school uh, staff, and resources, and, and working through those. And that's the kind of training that I'll be working with the, the city staff, um, as well as Resolute and setting up a multi-year kind of training exercise and um, look forward to doing that. And then of course, again, I can't overemphasize the importance of relationships and the rapport that we have um, with our SRO, with the police chief, with the city, with our fire chiefs. Um, communication is really key in these situations, right? I can call Officer Gillespie at any time and, and, and know that I'm gonna get somebody on the other end and, um, and able to deal with those situations. So, um, Mayor Heading, can I keep going? Can I go through a couple, these? A couple more minutes would be go great. Too long? But, but a couple more minutes and we'll have- Absolutely, questions. I'll make this quick. Thank you. So, so the, this is kind of the safety pillars, again, that we talked about. And so we have teams that, uh, administrative teams, um, that basically kind of go over each one. So again, safety is not just about what we're gonna do with school shooting. Um, it, you know, mental and behavioral health. Um, you know, we have counselors, we have mental health therapists, MFTs on our campuses. We have our nurses, we have our threat assessment team. So mental and behavioral health is, health is a huge part of safety and creating a, a culture of safety. Um, health and wellness. You know, it, we need to make sure our kids are getting fed. You know, we have family resource centers um, that, that help families from getting gas cards to having a place to live. Um, you know, we've really taken that on. Uh, child abuse reporting with our teachers and our staff. You know, again, that bullying concern button, letting people know what's what's happening. Um, you know, we do everything from training on, um, you know, human trafficking with our kids to, uh, again, trauma care, those types of things. So the physical environment is important. So being able to lock down the campus, having that video surveillance, having that VoIP phone system, um, you know, the, the Morro Bay PD has keys to our campuses. So does the fire chief. Like they can get in at any time 24-7 um, to do that. So um, the Resolute has done a overall plan of each of our sites, broken down everything that needs to be done from a safety perspective. And those are things that we want to work on and um, improve, of course, as we move forward. Having the single point of entry, I've talked about those types of things as well. Um, everything from having a visual plane from the front office so we don't have a bunch of trees and brush you know around so um those are all things that we'll we will consider as we move forward um again creating this culture climate uh community right so again the bully concern button um we have equity teams we have a common ground group we have a student senate we do parent surveys um, we do a lot of things to kind of again develop a culture about our schools we want people to tell us if they're seeing things or if they have concerns, right? You have to have that culture where people feel listened to, um, that that we're gonna, you know, take them seriously if if, if things come come forward, right? Again, as the chief said, you know, law is a big part of it. There's laws that we have to follow, regulations that we have to follow. Um, but we, you know, we have a great relationship with our SROs, with our um, emergency center. Um, we do drills uh, annually, again, from the whole county perspective, right? The EOC. Um, all those joint efforts are, are important. Um, and we've done, we've done um, 
you know, uh, active shooter drills at both comprehensive high schools over the course of the years uh, to have that kind of hands-on training for our staff. Um, and then lastly, again, the, the typical, you know, safety plans, uh, everything from Diablo Canyon drills to fire drills. Um, but I can't, you know, overemphasize that there's also reunification, relocation, um, a lot of other types of planning that goes into this um, when we talk about emergency readiness. So, um, you know, hopefully the council can see that, again, we take safety very seriously, um, but, but it's, honestly, it starts with our staff and kids every day. Kids need to know that there's a caring adult on our campuses that cares about them. Um, so again, the, if you have that relationship with kids, they will tell you what they're seeing. They will let you know if there's a danger, if they're, if they saw something on Facebook or Instagram or um, TikTok or something like that, right? They, they will let us know. And so um, that is something that we, you know, is probably priority one when we talk about safety. Fantastic. I appreciate the comprehensive overview. Chief Cox, thank you for um, um, an extremely comprehensive presentation that um, answered a lot of questions, I'm sure, for all of us, um, especially in these difficult times. Ryan, uh, we, we appreciate you and outlining what uh, exactly is going on with the school. We know there were impacts with COVID that kind of, I know, halted a lot of things in terms of routine operations and maybe performance improvement um, opportunities. And, and I think we all recognize that. Um, what we're gonna do is, is just go to a few council questions. And, and I just have a couple that I might start with. Um, um, and one may be an observation more than, than a question. Chief, um, I was particularly interested in your active um, shooter response kit. Not that all incidents are gonna be active shooters and that's the only thing we're concerned about. But that to me was extremely impressive. And um, I, I just wondered if, if you could elaborate. I noticed that it had some medical components that I think were very helpful, but could you um, just elaborate and reiterate the use of the components of that and, and how they might help uh, potentially injured students, um, injured uh, staff and, and how you would utilize that? Absolutely, Mayor. A great question, and, and let me let me emphasize this. And and I'm going to be very frank and 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 clear. In, in the case of a critical incident, it could be different. A, a critical incident could be something, uh, you know, like a robbery at a bank or a liquor store or something where somebody may be injured. There, in an active shooter situation, it's an entirely different situation, uh, and that medical kit on the officer becomes secondary because our, our goal at that time is to stop the threat. Uh, and, and that is the only goal we have at that time is to enter the premises and stop the threat. Now that, that medical kit becomes secondary and once that threat has been eliminated, then we will be able to tend to uh, the medical needs uh, of the students and staff members that may be injured. And this is why, <clears throat> excuse me, this is why it is so critical to have the collaborative training that we do with fire with EMS and with our school staff and faculty, because in those trainings, we outline exactly this, what our priority is and what our functions are going to be once we arrive on scene. And a lot of times as we're moving through the school or moving through the location, we have fire and EMS uh, behind us and hopefully what we're creating, what we call a warm zone uh, so that they're not putting themselves at, at the same risk that the officers are but that they're able to treat the, those people with medical needs that we're not going to stop and treat. Uh, and, and hopefully, uh, you know, that's why it's so important to be able to relay to these other folks what they will be needed to do during this type of an incident. Uh, and and it's, it's scary, you know, in these trainings, uh, you know, for anybody that's been through an active shooter training, you know, the last one we did at Morro Bay High, we, we got some feedback that uh, it made some folks uncomfortable. And we totally get that. We understand that. And that's not the goal. But the goal is to is to make them aware uh, that in this type of situation, their role is going to change as well. We're going to need them to step up and address some of these medical needs that the officers will not be able to take the time to do until that threat is eliminated. So th those kits contain uh, some of the most important 
uh, items. Uh, again, you know, for, for different types of wounds, uh, they carry, every one of the officers carries a tournament on their person. Uh, this is a secondary tournament that's included in that kit uh, just because we have no idea how many victims we could end up with. So, so the kit doesn't, I mean, obviously it, it doesn't contain everything uh, an EMS person might have, but it, it hopefully contains enough of the things that we would need in that immediate moment uh, when we are able to first, again, eliminate the threat and then treat those that need the, the most important medical needs at that time. Fantastic. Um, appreciate the expanded explanation. I was interested in the um, RAVE uh, mobile app, Chief, and I was just curious. I think you mentioned that staff at schools have this countywide. I'm wondering um, if there's application for students to have that um, and or if that's something that's a consideration. And, and, and this may be directed at, at Ryan as well. I made a note when you were presenting about, you know, um, the student's ability to report um, what I'll call red flag or potentially mental health or warning um, kinds of issues. Is this something that potentially could be utilized for that? Well, I, I, can, I, I do know that the RAVE mobile app at this time is not available to students. No. Uh, and, and I think, unfortunately, there's some concern for abuse of the system uh, if, if students were to have that on their, on their app. Uh, every student that wanted to get out of class would would utilize that emergency notification and we'd be responding there, you know, dozens of times a day. Um, but it does, it is available for all faculty, staff members, uh, you know, any uh, janitors, any, anybody uh, working uh, at the school site that, that would need access to that system. Great, appreciate that. And um, my last question, because I know there are other council members that have questions as well. Um, Ryan, again, thank you for the overview, very, very broad. And I know that resources are always an issue, financial constraints, so forth and so on. But I, I couldn't help, you know, with regard to our local school, schools and there's change going on at the high school, um, concerned about multiple points of entry and perimeter fencing. And I'm wondering, uh, you kind of skipped over that in your presentation, but I think about our elementary school, um, more or less wide open. And, and perhaps you could articulate to the community what the plan might be for Morro Bay with regard to um, limiting access and having such a broadly open set of campuses. That's my opinion and tell me if yeah. I'm wrong. <laughs> no, I would agree. So there's a, so two things. One, the students know about the bully concern button. So just, I mean, with that's, I would say 90% of our bully concern uh, come directly from the kids. Cool. So that's something we talk about. They know, right? They should, you know, let us know. And, um, and and it's great. Like I said, the fact that they're willing to tell us is an absolute fantastic thing. Um, and they can stay anonymous throughout, right, through through that system as well. So that that helps. Um, in terms of the perimeter fencing, again, Measure D, two comprehensive high schools focused on uh, Morro Bay High, San Luis Obispo High School, almost done, which is great. Um, we have several campuses throughout our camp or throughout our San Luis Coastal that um, that are wide open. As you, as you say, Del Mar being one of them, right? So, um, you know, as we go through this, it's kind of a balance because yes, it's, uh, you don't want your schools to look like prisons, but yet you, you have to have security, right? You have to have that secure. So you'll notice like across the front of Morro Bay High in the front anyways, we've done kind of a decorative fencing, right? So it looks nice, it's appealing. Um, kind of same thing at San Luis Obispo High School on the front there. So we, uh, you know, I was meeting with Dr. Prater today. We're going to go around, you know, next week, walk sites again, looking at what we can get accomplished this summer. Um, the, the school board is, is uh, recently passed a, uh, a, a future bond measure for the November 22 ballot, I will tell you, that's going to come up. Um, and so part of that is going to be the, the, these emergency things that we're talking about. So from fencing to um, the interior door locks, which all of those uh, types of issues will be addressed through that potential bond measure in November. Um, we'll be talking more about that more in the fall, you know, as we as we move forward. Um, so we we will look at it. I, I mean, again, at Del Mar in particular, you're talking about major, um, not just fencing, but also just changing the whole front of the campus when you put fence along there. Because you have to look at ADA accessibility, you know, path of travel, those types of things, the bus drop off, um, pick up. So um, it's something that we we will do, 
and are going to have to find the funds to to do it one way or the other. So um, I, I, I just don't I, I would hate to put up temporary fencing right now that looks horrible. But, you know, that's something that we may have to consider. And so, Dr. Prater, we just talked about it this morning about walking those campuses next week to, to see what we can do in the meantime until we can get architect plans and, and put something together. So, um, again, all those other items that we talked about in terms of safety planning, you know, those are also key things as we move forward. But yes, uh, after Uvalde, again, we've had many, you know, public concerns from citizens about, again, Pacheco Elementary School, Del Mar. Um, you know, really across the board. So we've been trying to hit, you know, a school or two each year. Uh, and, and so, you know, definitely I would say Pacheco and Del Mar, probably the two right now that stand out the most in terms of just that open access along the front. All right, and thank you. Ma Mayor, if I could yes, interject. Absolutely, Chief, yes. Real, real quick on, on this topic. And, and this is uh, obviously a concern that we've talked about. And SRO uh, Alex Gillespie is available uh, here tonight if there were any questions for him, but due to the open campuses of both of our high schools, I, I met with Alex and I met with all of our sergeant teams and, and, and they're all working together. Alex, uh, the SRO with each of our patrol officers, that's every patrol officer that we have to do walkthroughs of the schools to identify the entry points and exit points of the schools uh, because they are open and then to be familiar with all of the classroom locations, especially with the many changes that have been at Morro Bay High School, and that's important because uh, some of these officers, you know, if you're not assigned to the school and there's an officer there every day, you don't typically respond to the school. So, so each one of them are working with the SRO to do physical walkthroughs at every one of these sites to familiarize themselves with the locations, with the buildings, with the entry and exit points as well. Great. Thank you, Chief. I appreciate it. Well, I don't want to monopolize the time, so I'm going to open it up to other council members. If you have a question for Chief Cox, our SRO, or um, Ryan Pickerton, raise your hand. Oh, Council Member Ford, yes. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Chief Cox and Mr. Pinkerton. Um, great reports. Um, I, you know, having kids that have gone through. Um, our district uh, and listening to their um, their reactions and responses when they go through the after sh the active shooting drills and that sort of thing. Um, I, I really do appreciate all that our district has done. Um, and as well as, you know, our having an officer on campus, um, Chief, I want to, I just want to commend um, Officer Gillespie because my daughter who just graduated said he is amazing and um, just, you know, I think having uh, an officer on campus, not only is it there for safety, but it also familiarizes our students with, you know, with the officers and knowing that they can, you know, build that trust. Um, but anyway, what I'm getting back to is um, during that process, um, a couple of things that happened with my oldest daughter during lockdowns, one was an actual lockdown, it was a threat. Um, is that she was locked out. She had gone to the restroom and she was locked out of her classroom and did not know what was happening. And then it dawned on her what was happening because all the classrooms were locked down and there was no students around. Um, is that part of the newer training for the kids during lockdowns? Is there some sort of protocol if they are locked out of their classrooms because they were in between classrooms or in the restroom? Is, is that part of the training nowadays for lockdowns? Yeah, they should. I mean, anyone, again, as they as they go around, they should try to pull kids in as they, you know, as you go through the system. So and it's, you know, I would say over the last couple of years, there hasn't been a lot of training, you know, with the pandemic in terms of just kids not even being on campus. Right. So it's been a little strange, I would say, you know, over the past couple of years in particular. But um, for the most part, we try to tell kids just to get anywhere, like to pull in and, and teachers, any kids in the area, pull them into your classroom, right, when that happens. Um, but excellent point. Something I can, you know, we'll talk about and and uh, discuss. Okay, awesome. Because I, I think, you know, just little simple, yeah. simple things to mention to kids, you know, oh, just in case you're in that Agreed. situation. She panicked is what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no, no. so. Um, it's scary. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then another question I have, um, first of all, I, I want to say all that the district has done to prepare for this is amazing. I was looking at your, your long list and you guys have come so far. 
um, since we moved to this district, I'm just impressed by all that, that has happened. Um, one of the things, one of my other um, concerns is you had, you kind of touched on sub training, um, substitutes. Um, how, can you kind of give me a little bit more information on how substitutes are trained? Because of course they may not go through the drills as much as the teachers that are normally on campus go through. So can you explain how, how our substitutes are trained for active well, shooting? Yeah. So I just, just in general, our substitutes go through a training when they're first hired. So they, when they come on board, so it's, it's, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, it's, it's probably not great in terms of the amount of training that they receive because they're, you know, as a sub, you can go all over the place, you know, different school settings, different types of things. So um, it was, it's one of the areas that we need to focus on in terms of, you know, like I said, the training plan and kind of kicking that back in. They get a sub folder normally when they come onto campus, which has all the emergency drills, those types of things, but it's not going to prepare them for you know, for a situation like that in terms of, you know, active shooter, lockdown drill types of things. And so honestly, at that point, we need the kids to know the kids to talk to the sub and tell them what mm -hmm. to do. Right. And so that's that, you know, and, and again, especially at the, at the high school level and even middle school, I would say the kids, the kids are great. Like they, they understand, they know, so they have to be brought in and, and part of that culture. Um, and, and so that's part of that Again, it's it's part of the multi-year training um, that we need to do with our staff because they're they're not trained enough. They they need more training, and we need to review this more and go over it more. Um, we have the plans ready to go, but it's it, it is definitely kind of the next step for us is to really lay that out with staff. Okay. And we have a lot of new, a lot of new staff too, right? So it's you know they maybe weren't part of the you know, the Morrill Bay, um, you know, practice active shooter drill four or five years ago, right? So it's something that we, you know, we need to lay out. And and that's where Rob Lewin and Resolute um, are super helpful because they are, are just excellent planners, you know, in terms of helping us get this together. Well, I appreciate your honesty. Thank you. Yeah. That's all I have. Oh, good, okay, good. Okay, thank you. Um, other council member questions? Council member Addis. Please. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Ryan, and thank you, Chief, for all of the information. And my question is more for the Chief. I um, And I will just start by saying I have full confidence in Morro Bay PD to show up and to um, do the job that they need to do. However, there's been so much in the news and a lot of finger pointing at police. And I'm just wondering how Morro Bay PD um, guarantees that our officers like what 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 how do you know our officers really will show up and do what needs to be done and i think you said yourself like it is a scary situation for everybody obviously it would be um if this were to happen here and um and so how do we know that people will really follow through and again well, i have confidence great. i'm just asking if you can kind of share that, that that's a that's a great question uh, and, 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 I'll, and, and in a, an act of transparency and total honesty, uh, I'll, I'll share with you. Uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, it's, it's so difficult for us to find the qualified and capable people that we find. We, we have some hiring standards here uh, that, that we don't just take a body to fill a hole, uh, which is why we've worked shorthanded uh, for some of the links that we have, because we we make it a point to find the right people for this organization. Uh, and, and I'll share with you that, that shortly after this incident, uh, we pulled all of our patrol sergeants together and, and, and we, we had what I like to call a come to Jesus meeting uh, with all of my patrol sergeants. And, and, and that was part of that topic of conversation is that uh, I, I need to know that they, that they feel that they are comfortable and confident in responding to this exact type of situation. Uh, and that they feel that same way about all of the staff members that they have on their patrol teams. Uh, and if they're not, and, and one of the things I asked them to do was to, to share uh, with, with their staff and to have these candid conversations, uh, understanding the risk and, and knowing that this is what we're called to do. And most of the men and women that sign on for this job uh, understand that risk and they're willing to take that risk uh, without question. Uh, and, and again, that's that's why we select the people that we do. But we have these candid conversations 
uh, internally amongst our staff, amongst our supervisors, and even amongst our patrol staff uh, to make sure that they feel comfortable, that they have the training that they need, they have the equipment, the resources, and the tools that they can respond and, and know that when they go, you know, they, they, they have to go and they have to handle their business. Um, and that, and that's a, you know, you use the word guarantee. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that you're ever going to get a guarantee uh, of anything like that, but that's why we go through the processes that we do, the backgrounds and hiring uh, processes that we do to make sure that we get the men and women that are coming here to do the job that we ask them to do. And I will say too, Councilman Addis, when, when we do the simulations and drills, they go, they go in. I mean, their, their goal is to take out, as, as Chief Cox said, take out the, the, the threat, right? So um, that's part of that planning. It's part of that um, simulations that they do. Um, I've seen it firsthand, you know, at, at, working with all the different law enforcement agencies. And I think that helps. Well, I, I appreciate that. And thank you for taking the time to talk about it because I don't want to come off as if I don't think that Morro Bay PD would um, because I do think that, you know, I do have a lot of faith and trust in our police force. But the other question I had, and again, this just comes from, you know, kind of talk in the world is um, how do people know who's in charge in that kind of hectic situation? This is another kind of thing that's, you know, people are talking about, like, especially in, um, in regards to a couple of the last school shootings is the uh, again, that another, people didn't know. Another great <laughs> question. And that goes towards the type of training and we do in ICS and other types of trainings about incident command and shared command and those types of things. And, and, and our officers know the, the first the first officer on scene is in command until he's relieved by a higher ranking officer. Now, that may be a senior officer, that may be a patrol sergeant, uh, that may be the commander or it may be myself. Again, you know, school hours, Monday through Friday, the commander and I are both are both here and working. So the chances are that the commander or I are going to show up uh, faster than some of the allied agencies or support staff that would be coming in to assist us. So the first officer on scene is the incident commander until he's relieved by a higher ranking officer that arrives on the scene. And, and then again, as, as the, the sergeant or a command staff member arrives, they take uh, command of that situation. Uh, and, and again, I, I, I know kind of what you're referencing uh, and I agree. You 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 don't you don't get to hand off the responsibility. You you, you don't get to do that. Uh, you, when you arrive, you're responsible, and you take command of that scene. And that's what all of our staff is trained to do. Uh, and you can you can talk to any member of this organization from from the newest guy that I just hired uh, up to myself that I teach everybody in this organization that you're a leader, and I expect you to be a leader on every scene that you're on, regardless of whether a higher ranking officer is there or not. And the motto of this organization is to represent well. And I expect them to represent this organization on every every critical incident or every call for service that they respond to. And that's, that's what we teach. It's also critical too, I think, as we've gone through these simulations, like at other county jurisdictions, that, you know, Morro Bay, they work with San Luis Obispo, with the county, with the sheriff's office, with yeah. PD, with, um, you know, with all the other organizations. So they know, like, if it's a Morro Bay incident, they're in charge. And the other organizations come and they just wrap around the, the PD, right? And vice versa. Something in San Luis where Morro Bay is going to help, they become kind of an asset for them, whether it's SWAT team or those other types of things. So it, that's why those simulations, you know, having Morro Bay participate in those um, with the other agencies are, are really critical, right, to establish that kind of chain of command um, wherever it is. Well, thank you for that. I, I think we're in a unique situation with the allied agencies and the mutual aid and the collaboration across this county, and it's been um, a, incredibly important, especially for a small city like ours um, who can't do everything on our own. And I'm hopeful for the school bond measure. And I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that school board voted to move that forward. And um, and appreciate both of your time this evening. Thank you, Councilmember Addis. Appreciate it. Other questions? Seeing no hands, I'm going to go ahead and open up public comment. This is public comment for item C1 on our business agenda. Public comment for item C1 is now open. 
And Anthony, do we have any public comments, sir? Oh, uh, thank you, Mayor Heading. Currently, I do not see any raised hands in the queue. Okay, I will close public comment, bring it back to the council. Um, more than I expected this evening, um, I appreciate the comprehensive nature of the overview. Um, and I especially appreciate from both the school district and our own uh, PD, the collaborative nature of working together on these issues. I do think that that's absolutely critical and key. And, and I hear the, the communication lines are open. Um, the links are there. And um, I'm proud that uh, both entities represent themselves well. I'm appreciative of um, Officer Gillespie, our SRO. Thank you so much for your service. We appreciate everything that you do, Chief and your staff. Um, you've always been an advocate for training. Um, you have brought me an increased level of comfort this evening with regard to um, my sense of what would happen if a critical incident occurred, <clears throat> such as the one that happened recently in Uvalde, Texas. And I'm proud of uh, not only our, our, our staff, um, but also our leadership. and. Uh, your extreme commitment to training, which I think is absolutely critical and key. Um, Mr. Pinkerton, I appreciate you being here tonight. I know that um, the school district has been kind of um, stymied for a couple of years with COVID, and I appreciate your honesty and integrity with regard to that. And I agree with Councilmember Addis, uh, to extend an opportunity for Dr. Prater to come forward when you want to discuss that bond measure and make us aware of what's going on and why we might desperately need that to um, ensure the safety of our uh, children and young people um, in this community. And a number of us on the council um, have children and or grandchildren in this school district, and I would be um, in the latter category. And so um, uh, that's not the only reason for my concern, but a lot of community members are talking about it and asking questions and, and again, uh, I think showcasing that, that this item this evening was important to begin the discussion in our community. So thank you so much for being here. And I'll uh, this is a receive and file, but any other comments from council members, um, I'd be happy to entertain at this time. Council Member Heller. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Yes, uh, I can't hear you. Jeff muted, you're muted. How about that? There you go. Thanks. So Chief Cox, I, I'm always amazed at your commitment to training, your commitment to this city, your commitment to safe, safety, and your remarks tonight, as well as those of Mr. Pinkerton are just remarkable. And I wanna thank you for your service and your officer's service. And I have no doubt that not only are they well-trained, but they're also brave and ready to protect us. Uh, whether it's a school or any place else in our city. And I really cannot thank you enough for, for your service to the city and the residents who live here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member Heller. Other comments? Hearing none, again, thank you all for being here. Um, that completes this item and we will move to item C-2. This is um, um, uh, receive a, a presentation on the upcoming Highway 1, um, State Route 1, uh, pavement rehabilitation and improvements project from Caltrans and provide feedback and recommendations for improvements to be considered with project design. And I'm happy to welcome Mr. Qualick here to introduce the item. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as mentioned in the staff report, Caltrans is planning um, pavement rehabilitation of State Route 1. And that rehabilitation extends through the entire limits of State Route 1 um, in, in Morro Bay. And uh, it's the way Caltrans does capital projects. They do them several years out so that they have about five years of, of design and planning work. Um, and so during that time, uh, they very courteously reached out to the city and asked uh, whether or not the city would be seeking any additional improvements outside of the pavement rehabilitation. Uh, and so we did uh, go to our PWAB uh, to request feedback. Um, and Mr. Ridio uh, is available uh, at, after Caltrans's uh, presentation to discuss 
PUAP's feedback uh, and also to answer questions. Uh, but I, I would like to uh, kick it over to Kevin Jones and Amy Donatello, who are here with us today from Caltrans, uh, to give a general overview of the project uh, and what their plans are. And then I, I hope uh, we can receive some additional feedback from City Council on what sorts of improvements uh, you all would like to see uh, before the city formally gives that feedback to Caltrans. So without further ado, uh, I'll, I'll give it over to Kevin. And welcome, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, for having me um, and council members. Thank you. Um, shall I share my screen? Or I know Heather had a presentation. Yes, you can share your screen if, if okay. you have the presentation right there. Thank you. Um, here we go. Okay, can you see my screen? Perfect, thank you. Okay, thank you. So um, so thank you for um, having us again. Um, Caltrans historically has sometimes not been the best at reaching out to local agencies and let them know what's happening. So we're trying to, to change that. Um, so this project, it's a simple, um, we call it a capital maintenance paving project. Um, and it's scheduled pretty far out. It's just the planning stage, but the way Caltrans works, a lot of the major items get decided in the planning stage and get carried forward. It's like steering a big ship. If you start it off steering the right direction, it goes smoothly. If you don't, it doesn't. So here's a very quick presentation just to let you know what's happening. So the purpose first is just tr transparency so that you can know what we're doing. Because sometimes it can be frustrating to see what is Caltrans doing? Um, so I'll let you know what we're doing. Um, there are opportunities for the city of Morro Bay to suggest minor in terms of cost improvements and opportunities for cost sharing for larger scale improvements. So again, this is a, intent is a paving job. Um, the main asset that we're trying to preserve is the pavement. And we will do some other minor improvements, but it's not a highway widening. There's no additional overpasses. It's a, it's a capital maintenance job. So, so that you can know why I'm talking to you Kevin, about the Kevin, project. Kevin, yes. um, I meant to talk, but my I couldn't figure out how to unmute myself. But um, I wanted to just to give a brief overview before you started in. Um, Go ahead. I'm sorry. So this is I'm Amy Donatello, the project manager, and this is the uh, capital maintenance project. It's a seven mile long project. It starts about two miles uh, north of the Cuesta uh, College or over by the shooting range. And it goes all the way to uh, through Morrill Bay and up to um, is it San Lucido Creek or is it the other? It's, uh, that's the south, which is the North Creek. Kevin? The, the northern limit is by the cemetery in Cayucas. Right. right. And it's a $25 million project. And um, I just wanted to introduce myself and give a brief overview. But Kevin's the main guy on this. He, he has all the all the um, engineering parts of it. So, so I'm sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead, Kevin. Thank you, Amy. And Amy's our project manager. Um, and I'm the design engineer. So, so again, the timeline, why we're talking to you about a project that's five years out. Um, I will not go into the details of how budgeting works at the state level, but essentially it works on four year kind of chunks. Um, and to make our budgeting for the next four year chunk, we have to plan now. So this is the big timeline. Um, if you have more detailed questions or want to hear more about that, you can ask in a follow up. Um, but essentially it's because of state budgeting requirements. Um, like Amy mentioned, these are the project limits, a uh, mile north of the gun range to uh, up near Cayucas. So the city of Moore Bay um, stands the project. Okay, so the scope of our project is the pavement. That's the priority. Um, there's a couple freeway lightings and old signs that we'll be replacing. Um, to make curb ramps up to ADA standards, there are some that we might have to replace. 
The reason we have to replace good looking curb ramps is because if they do not meet the ADA standard, we are required to by law. So um, if they're not compliant, we will replace them um, so that they can Kevin, be a, your, your speaker's going in and out a little bit. Your voice is going in and out. How about this? Can you hear me here? We can That's hear good. you just fine, Kevin. Thank you. Um, so there is a curb ramp at San Jacinto Street that does not exist. Um, so we are planning to install one there. Um, also, potential minor improvements are underneath the two undercrossings where there are sidewalks that are just asphalt and they get cracks in them and the asphalt forms bumps and they generally degrade a lot faster. We can improve them with concrete sidewalks. So a lot of these are very maintenance level um, improvements. We might add some lighting, probably non-decorative lighting underneath the undercrossings to improve just nighttime safety. Um, but this is the project scope as it stands. Um, and again, we are soliciting uh, feedback from the city of Morro Bay because it goes right through your neck of the woods. Um, we, there will be future discussion about more minor improvements. So we are not trying to iron every little detail, uh, but that how Caltrans works is if there are bigger cost items that we, we try and initiate cost sharing at an early date. So that's my last slide. And Cotton Beach on the Toe is the single point of contact. And I will go back to this slide for questions. Um, so thank you for your attention. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate the presentation. And i um, going to go ahead and open it up to um, any council member questions. And then I'm going to go to public comment and see if you have any comments or I'll take comments now also, but I will be going to public comment. So council member questions. And let me try to see if I can get a view. I can't see your hands. Let me look here. Um, Don, there we go. Uh, council member Heller, I see your hand. Thank you. Council member Addison, Addison uh, Ford were ahead of me, but. Okay, sorry. Um, I had that, you know, speaker view with that. Yeah. Council member Addis, please. Sorry about that. Well, I'm elated that these particular upgrades might happen in North Morrow. We've lived here for 20 years and have wished for upgrades at these particular locations. There are places that we have walked, uh, pushed a stroller, walked a dog, ridden bicycles, take walk with, walks with friends. And I'm just so happy that there's gonna be some attention uh, to these this part of the highway. So one question I have is, will the um, curb, ramp at, curb ramp at San Jacinto, will it, um, be an upgrade similar to what's across the highway, like where it's going to wrap, you know, wrap the entire corner and actually give pedestrians a way to not stand uh, right next to traffic as they're waiting to cross the highway or. Yeah. And, and if not, can we please, that would be my feedback. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the plan is to do as much as we can. There are some like, interagency things to work out because the technical property line right wraps right in the middle of like what would be the full like curb section so we kind of because that's not a giant ticket cost item we kind of punt that discussion to later um, but at minimum we're going to put a curb ramp all throughout the property that caltrans owns so there will be plenty of space to have a stroller and you can see the chain link fence kind of delineates the the edge of our property so so we're at minimum going to do that but there will not be a sidewalk going up the freeway because it goes up the freeway on the other side because there's a bus stop there and we don't want to encourage people walking on the side of the freeway so there will not be a sidewalk going there well my thank you for that and uh i'll just please do the interagency work that it takes to make this a safe crossing. And my other feedback would be if we could please have a longer light for pedestrians. 
because um, you get out in the middle of this crossing and the light starts to change and it's very unnerving, especially if you're with um, little ones with short legs or older people who, you know, walk slower or um, folks on bikes, you know, it doesn't look like a hill there, but it's actually a little bit hard to get a start on a, on a bike going yeah. up that, um, up that incline as you cross the highway there. And, um, thank goodness I have not witnessed ever an accident there, but it's, you know, yeah. everybody's great fear. And then as I know I'm preaching to the choir, but it's part of the safe route to school. Um, and so, you know, hundreds of children cross over there every day. Um, so th that, those would be my two. And then, you know, I think, I don't know if there's lighting under that underpass right now, but I would love to see, you know, a more inviting space for that underpass, especially for our high school students that traverse twice a day, every day. Yeah. Um, this is Amy. Um, I question, are you saying that when the light says, walk it turn it turned off quickly i think are you is that what yes. you're saying because that just means that it, no new people can start walking i think that isn't that right kevin so when it turns on it means you can start walking but if it turns off that means any new new pedestrians can't start to walk but it doesn't mean that the light's going to turn on you while you're middle while you're in the middle of the road is that right kevin that is correct um i think i understand too that dawn is saying that Perhaps even that being true, perhaps it is still a time crunch. Is that what you're saying, Ms. Abby? Yeah, and especially, you know, when you're uh, with little kids who don't want to be in their stroller and, uh, you know, or, or grandparents who might not be walking as quickly, that it's unnerving to get out in the middle of the highway and then, the th and then it starts changing. Um, yeah. and, you know, it's very nerve wracking and you always wonder, like, is that next car that comes, are they going to really see that someone's in this crosswalk? And it's all, it's just always felt like it's a little uh, too short. If there's a way to, you know, make it longer by a second or two, I think it would make a huge difference for um, really for residents who live here, visitors who come here, who are crossing a a pretty well-traveled highway with, you know, high traffic, a lot of speed. Thank you. Um, and just to clarify, uh, Amy is right. Once it changes from the, the, the walker person to the stop does not mean that it changes to a green light at that moment for the cross traffic. Um, it just means new pedestrians should stop trying to cross. But I yeah. think comments are, are understood. Thank you. Thank you. Great questions and comments. Appreciate that. Council member Ford, please. Thank you, Mayor Heading. Um, I, I actually, since we're talking about this uh, particular intersection and the light, um, I have a question regarding um, the voice, the audio commands for crossing for those who have, you know, difficulty seeing or maybe blind, um, who, you know, crossing a highway is a concern and um, I'm just curious if that is a part of this improvement for ADA compliance. Um, just curious if that that's something that's going to be incorporated. That's a good question. Um, so you'll, if you've been to the Old Creek crossing up near Cayucas, um, you've maybe seen different colored, and they actually have a voice component to them. So the new standard is to have a voice component to it. Um, it, there's kind of a, I guess, a gray area. If the one, if the current push buttons are, like, do are at the correct height, and they're compliant, um, and it would cause us to have to put in a new signal pole to change it. Usually, um, usually we don't. But if one is going in, for example, if we already need to move the signal pole, then then we install it with the up to the current standard. So sorry to give a vague answer, but that's you that's usually how it works. So there's no um, to directly answer your question, there is no for sure plan to do that, but because you said that, I will now put it on my checklist of things to look into and see <laughs> make happen. 
that I would appreciate that. Yeah, it's it's something that I think about every time I cross that. If if I had any, uh, you know, any problem with sight, I don't know how I would know when to cross. So yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's a concern of mine. Um, another is I don't I don't know how expensive it is, but I know in other uh, cities they have at crossings they have lights that go all across the the ground you know blinking lights and being that it is a heavily trafficked highway at high speeds is that also something that is in consideration or is that out of Usually, the scope of <laughs> yeah that's a good question um because it's a actual freeway facility um that's usually through like lower speed where that those kind of pedestrian beacons are in. What we can do that has been suggested um, by Mr. Radio is um, you know, there's different striping patterns for crosswalks that make them more or less visible. Um, so the, the continental one, as you can see there, there's just two parallel lines, whereas the more visible ones have the two parallel lines with the other cross things going through. Um, so, but in general, we don't put those across um, high-speed facilities. Um, it's, I don't, yeah, so in general, we don't do that. So. Okay. And then my last question regarding that intersection is, um, and actually I, I attended the PWAB meeting, the public works meeting, um, and I want to just uh, say that I agree with their suggestion. Um, it's probably in the report um, for a no right turn on red um when you are going north ish i don't know i'm really bad with directions here but going north on the highway and turning right um onto san jacinto um yeah. because that intersection is pretty messy and kind of scary um i really do think that in the meantime that would be a great suggestion to have no right turn on a red for two reasons one it helps the craziness the hecticness of that intersection and pedestrians and the many car accidents I almost see happen on a daily basis, but also from my own experience when walking from the ocean side of the highway over, you know, across the highway on Santa Centro towards Maine, when you're walking and all of the traffic is lined up and they, uh -oh. the, the per yeah, the person in the right turning lane can't see the pedestrians coming and they just assume it more often than not, they just take off. And there's been many close calls where I've had to like literally grab my kids' shirts and pull them back because I'm like, they're not paying attention. You're going to get ran over. So I, I really want to just repeat that request um, that I think it's important to consider a no turn, no right turn, no turn on red light um, in that intersection. And then um, lastly, uh, my my last. Uh, comment is regarding the rumble strips um, we actually had someone um, a community member write in in concern of the rumble strips uh, being too far over into the bike lane um, and that it may be too late by the time and um, a distracted driver is aware that they are crossing over into the bike lane I don't know what the legalities are but is there any way that the rumble strip could be closer to the driver's side of that bike of that bike lane strip um, instead of on or across into the bike lane, if that makes sense. Um, I can answer I can answer that. Um, Go ahead. We have, a, at one point on Highway 1, just north of uh, near Cayucas, we, we, we actually put the, the rumble strip under the strike as you the travel. We got so, cars were hitting it. We got so many noise complaints from residents. We had to go out there and tear it out and put it over in the shoulder. So unless we have a really narrow shoulder, less than five feet, we, we can't put it, we don't put it under the, the um, stripe just because it's very loud when cars hit it. And when you put a rumble strip under the stripe like that, it gets hit. So that's why we put it in. We try to put it a foot inside. I mean, it should only be offset a foot from that edge of stripe. So, is, is that what you're noticing that it's you want it closer than that well the, the thought is that you know once you hit that rumble strip it might you might already be hitting a cyclist you know at that point um if you're if it's by the time you're notified that you're over because as we know either you're falling asleep or you're distracted right which is why right. more than likely you're you're hitting that strip 
and and hearing that noise. And so the concern, and I and I agree with the community member that wrote in that it is a concern that once you hit that, it may be too late. Um, but I mean, I I can see that it you do get those complaints. I can, I, I don't know. I just think that it's something to to request or consider if it's not something that is too much trouble. But it sounds like you've had complaints. Yeah, we've had to tear out a whole a whole project for of this, especially in the area that you live in. There's houses that are really located really close to the to the freeway, and they can. We actually took our our Caltrans car and sat out there and listened to how many cars hit it. You'd be amazed if, on a straight highway how many cars can't stay in the middle of the lane. You think people can drive down the middle of the road, but they don't. <laughs> so, but we'll take a note of your of your comment anyway. Okay, thank you. And that's all the the questions and uh, comments that I have. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilmember Ford. Councilmember Heller. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks for waiting, sir. Certainly. Uh, thank you both for being here tonight. Uh, off hours, I would imagine. Very excited that your Caltrans is uh, coming to town and making these kinds of improvements. Uh, I've got a few questions. Uh, one is, and we may have this already, but have you issued uh, the city a schematic drawing or notes that identify what is in the scope of project at this point? We do not. There, There is a um, project initiation report. Um, I do not know if that's typically publicly distributed. Eventually, there is a project report that I believe is publicly distributed. I can, I can answer that question. Thank you. Oh, you're, you're muted. muted. You're muted, Amy. You're muted. Uh, we will have a public document done in December of 2022. It's just it's just a project initiation document, but it's a public document, and we can we can um, distribute dis distribute it to whoever wants it, and that will be in December of 2022. At which time we will have the scope of the project. Right now, we're just and we're really in the initial stages, and we're just out there investigating. We don't know exactly what sidewalks or curb ramps, not sidewalks, but curb ramps need to be replaced. We're not sure of our scope of work yet, but we will have it uh, when we have a signed project initiation document in December and I and we can distribute that publicly. So I, when we get to that point, um, we'll include you in our distribution list. That's great. I appreciate that answer. That helps a lot. The uh, next question I have for the different improvements that we might, might want to add to it is there a timeline after that report in December when we need to have these suggestions to you? I mean, is it 30 days, 60 days? Is there a set time uh, for that? And then the, the follow-up question is, how long does it take for you to get the costs of these improvement back to us so that we can decide what we can afford? Well, at this point, we need to have any, and they have to be minor improvements in this Unless we do a cooperative agreement and have you guys chip in, we're limited to the amount of improvements that, that we can do. Sure. So, you know, right now it's limited to re replacing curb ramps that are down standard. If you have a minor request, like maybe, uh, I don't know, a small, say a small section of sidewalk, like a few feet of sidewalk that you want added, maybe we could do that. But we would need to know, we would prefer to need those improvements by in a couple months because we program the project in December and when we program it we program it for a certain amount of dollars and we need to know at that time prior to that how much the cost is going to be to add in any particular item that you want so you know we're pretty flexible adding small items but the big ticket items that would be something that we would have to coordinate with you to get your uh, buy-in and maybe do a partial funding for you guys to add it if it's something you know extreme like uh like for example prismo wanted us to put some bulb outs in the in the road and you know things like that we can't do okay so if we got you those things by the end of august would that be enough time for um, you to do those things or is that how i don't know what do you think kevin well yeah i've been working with um Mr. Ridio, and we've asked for by the beginning of August. Um, you know, it is a 
at the end of August would be fine. And again, I want to emphasize, you know, this is big ticket items that we really need at this point. It is, you know, projects scheduled for 2027, a lot can change in five years. Um, so minor type improvements, um, we don't have to have them all ironed out. Um, so, so yeah, we can, if you have ideas, we can talk about them now. Um, if, if it only works for you at the end of August, that's fine as well. Um, so we, we can be slightly flexible, but we want to try and get it all wrapped up by, by winter time, uh, 2022. Okay. Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, a minor project to us might be a major one to you. Yeah. So and I don't, I don't want to come in too late, you know, yeah. with, with our with our ideas or thoughts about that. So that's that's very helpful. So uh, just so you know what we're thinking, yeah. minor is like adding some delineators. Those are those things that stick up with a reflector on them. You know, things that don't cost a lot of money. Striping. Right. You stripe right. an intersection. What about what about signage on the highway uh, uh, regarding uh, you know you see the signs where they show a gas station and a hotel and a you know a blue sign oh, right, exit right, right. here something like that is that fairly minor? Um, so ye yes, in terms of cost, I would say in terms of coordination, no signs on the side of a highway are a tricky business in terms of you know, there's always a process, right? Um, okay. That's something that you can do independently of this project. Because um, this project is a maintenance, like replace what's there kind of project. Gotcha. Usually right. we don't install. Right. So I would suggest, unless you want to wait five years, um, <laughs> would suggest you could try and move that forward anytime. I know there are signs that say entering Morro Bay with those blue kind of like, you know, hotel, gas, you know, right, right. as you enter the, the limits of the city already. Um, so, sorry. Okay. I, maybe, I, maybe I missed it. So there's another department or another process in Caltrans that we should pursue if we want something. Yeah, and I can, can help to get that connected because I know it can be kind of. That'd be great. That yeah. would be helpful. Just, just in the, in the uh, radio's kind of communication I think you're going to provide a report or something that would be ideal for us um, if you just stuck that as a line item in there. Um, gotcha. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. The, uh, very helpful answers. I appreciate it. Then that's my last question. Thank hey, you thanks, much. Council Member Heller. Uh, Council Member Barton. Please. Well, patience, patience matters, you know. <laughs> so, um, Amy, I wanted to thank you for hitting on my personal pet peeve, which is the, the one that you mentioned about the rumble strips being under the stripe. Um, that's, that's one that's, um, I don't know why, my, seems like my car just seems to go find that rumble strip. And it always seems that if I just had another six inches or something, I'd stay off of it. But anyway, so thank you for mentioning that. Um, my one suggestion that hasn't been uh, touched on is the reflectivity in striping and thinking of this area as one that can be very foggy at night. Um, it's just something to be thinking of uh, so that the markings are more clear and clearer for longer. Um, so that's, that's one. Uh, and let's see here, what did I also put here? Oh, and I agree with all of Don's and Jen's comments regarding the um, boulder crosswalks and the timing of signals. Um, it does seem too short. I've been out there and felt like, ah, I'm gonna be standing in the middle when the cars take off. Um, and uh, along with that, there are different kinds of crosswalk um, signage <clears throat> that are commonly used around schools, but in this particular location could be used on a highway, I think. Um, and that would be a, um, it's a, a taller thing with a, a big, uh, bigger sign at the top that says, you know, what it would be like watch for pedestrians or pedestrians crossing. And I think it would, it would work maybe uh, tied into whether or not you push the button. Um, so when you started to walk, then it would, it would, be lit up. And I think that would be a better one for the cars that are still coming, still approaching the intersection. That would really be a visible um, sign. 
So anyway, those are my suggestions. I, I, I still want to reemphasize that the, the way those crosswalk lights work is that you push the button, it says walk, and then as soon as you step into the highway, it starts flashing again and says do not walk. But that means that cars, the cars are still stopped. It's just to protect any future pedestrians from walking. Because some people walk really slow. So once you step into the crosswalk, that sign's going to stop, start flashing and say, do not walk, do not walk. But yeah. that doesn't mean that the cars are going to keep, are, gonna, are now going to go. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I repeat it. I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but I want to emphasize that that's just automatic. But anyway, um, Kevin is making a list of items, and I'm trying to jot them down. I hope Kevin has them down, too, that we, we are going to address. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm here. I, my battery just gave me a little low sign, so I apologize. <laughs> I to make sure I have enough juice. Thank you. I had one um, public comment uh, from an individual that wrote in. And um, the comment was, um, uh, the, do you have the ability to allow the guardrails through Morro Bay to have more of a rural look than a concrete metropolitan look? Evidently in the past, um, you've been able to use wood rails. When Caltrans continued south, they gave us stamped concrete in keeping with the concept. So just wondering your thoughts about that. Kevin, I'll let you answer that. Do we have any concrete barrier on the job? Can't hear you, Kevin. I don't think we have any concrete barrier. I think it's all just regular guardrail. But um, Kevin, are you muted? Because you're. No, he's not muted. Oh. Yeah, well, I thought your mic was kind of going in and out a little bit. Maybe you can call in. Is there a number or, that you can Perhaps call? you could add that to the list as just a follow-up concern. Okay, well, yeah, we'll add it as a follow-up. But, but like, I, like he was saying, this is just a uh, maintenance project, and we don't have the funds to do a lot of extra. Um, Got it. But we can work with the we can work with the city, and if you guys are agreeable to a cooperative agreement, we can contribute to it. We, we could look into that, but I don't think there's any concrete barrier on the project. But um, Kevin, is that shake your head yes or no? Is there a concrete barrier on the project? No. You okay. Should call no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's helpful. Thank you. I just wanted to acknowledge that comment. Yeah, then, so, go ahead. The the height of the guardrails. Um, there were just concerns raised about visual impairment of the ability to see the ocean, although you should be driving your car when you're on the road looking straight ahead. But but um, are there height guidelines or restrictions? Uh, yes, we have a standard height for, for guardrail. I think it's um, 32 inches. Is that correct? Yeah. I'm That's, pretty low. <laughs> That's pretty low. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Very much appreciate the presentation, and um, I will go ahead and open up public comment. Uh, this is public comment for item C-2 on our agenda. Any member of the public wishing to comment on this item, please do so now. And Anthony, do we have any public comment? Uh, thank you, Mayor Heading. Currently, I do not see any raised hands in the queue. Okay, I'm going to close public comment, bring it back to council. This is a receive comments, and uh, I think um, we've got a couple of months. Thank you, Councilmember Hiller, for asking the question about timeline for further follow up. And perhaps we could ask um, Eric um, to arrange the opportunity for further input, um, given some of the comments that were made tonight. Uh, perhaps a, a, a continued agenda item to take final comments. Um, I don't know if you plan to go to PWAB one more time for comment or. Uh, at this time, we, we we certainly can go back to PWAB and it would have to be in our August meeting uh, since there is no meeting in July. But um, I do have quite a list of, of items that PWAB has already given input on. Um, okay. And I've also made it expressed to them that they can certainly email any additional requests and I would I would invite 
the council and yourself as well to to do that. Um, so I, I I in a in our last meeting with Kevin and Amy, I expressed that we get them a preliminary list uh, by the, by early August so that we could, and then that would give me time to um, kind of organize the list by um, priorities and then by function or by by scope, uh, whether it be striping. Um, you know, um, ADA accessibility issues, uh, signal issues, um, and, and so forth. Um, just to give you an idea, some of the other items that PWAB had, had raised that were discussed were, um, they had inquired about uh, the rumble strips as well, some of the ADA deficient uh, uh, ramps, uh, bicycle loops was brought up. Uh, for the signals, uh, the uh, the on and off ramps, whether they would be repaved as well with the project, uh, stormwater improvements. Um, yeah, we're also. repaving all the ramps. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, sound barrier, sound barriers, which is a, is a big ask, I'm sure, but uh, that was brought up. Uh, lighting no, was someone. mentioned. Yeah, so I don't want to go through and, and have feedback on the list right now. I just want to, what I'd like to do is, the point I was trying to make is if council has further inputs, that somehow there's something that comes back to us so that we all see them, so that it's not individual input. And so whether you work with Mr. Collins and I on agendizing an item, um, I just want to make sure if there are additions that are emailed in, that the full council looks at those and acts on that. So that'd be my concern. Yeah, we can we can certainly put a list of our, our final list that will be going to Caltrans together so that it can be seen by all. Fantastic. Good. Well, great process. Thank you so much, Amy, for being here. I, I do pre appreciate the presentation, Kevin. Looking forward to working with Caltrans and minimizing uh, moral Bay's expenditure and maximizing the outcome associated with that. <laughs> Did you catch that, Amy? <laughs> <laughs> uh, for council member Addis, make, uh, make note that this grandfather works or walks as fast as his grandchildren. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you thought I missed it. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. That ends this item. And um, that brings us to item C-3 tonight. This is authorizing the city manager to execute one amendment number two to the contract with Cogna, uh, Cogstone Resource Management. Number two, amendment number seven to contract with Far Western um, Anthropological Research Group. Number three, amendment number four to contract with Anvil Builders for the WRF lift station and offsite pipelines construction project. And number four, amendment to number six to Corolla Engineers. And I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Qualic once again. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yes, there are four contract amendments in front of City Council tonight. Um, just a kind of very high level overview, and then I'll kick it over to Paul Miko, our program manager for the work program. Um, Anvil Builders, there are seven um, potential change orders that uh, are, are up for amendment tonight. Uh, one of them is a, a pretty substantial credit back to the city um, through one of our regulators, um, uh, rescinded a requirement uh, that was advantageous uh, to us. And uh, then also six other other potential change orders, um, four of which were due to some unknown conditions, two of which were requested by the city. Um, and also wanted to mention the uh, Cogstone contract uh, is for additional uh, monitoring of cultural resources, and that is uh, driven by our regulators. Um, we have the two other uh, contract amendments for uh, Far Western and for Corolla, those are both non-compensable amendments that are strictly just time extensions uh, so that we can cover uh, those contracts beyond the end of the fiscal year in a couple of weeks. Uh, I do wanna mention with the Corolla engineers contract, um, that contract uh, has a, a requested budget for next fiscal year that city council will hear again on June 28th. Um, that is not going to necessarily be the final budget for the Corolla contract. That is something that will still be negotiated uh, first through the WARF subcommittee um, and then ultimately will come back to council for approval uh, probably in, in early August. 
So uh, with that, I will give it over to Paul Amico uh, to discuss in more detail the Anvil contract and the Cogstone contract. Hey, Paul, welcome. Thank you, Director Prolick. Good evening, Mayor, Council members, and community members. Uh, if you just bear with me a second, let me share my screen. <clears throat> I have a brief presentation um, for uh, that covers this. Um, as I always like to do, I always like to give a little construction update before we get into the real business of the meeting here, uh, which are the contract amendments. Um, <clears throat> here's a nice view of the ocean and the rock, and you can see pump station A here from our drone footage. Um, pump stations A and B on the conveyance facilities are moving right along. If anybody drives by Limos, uh, they can see that the building is out of the ground and now everything on the surface is, uh, is taking place. Uh, and then pump station A, which you see on the left, uh, rough grading going on. So the building's looking good, the roof is on, uh, things are progressing. In fact, I believe both of these facilities uh, have been green tagged, which means we're ready to move forward with PG&E to get these buildings energized. Um, next time we speak, I'll probably have a better date for when that would happen. Uh, but but again, uh, really good news. The the Anvil struggled with uh, dewatering at Pump Station A, and they've really really done a great job to turn that uh, site around and get that project back on uh, back on schedule. <clears throat> uh, another pretty notable uh, milestone for us is the backfilling of the microtunnel casing pit uh, adjacent to the roundabout, the old U-Haul um, uh, property. So when you see the guy on the left here, so he's got a he's down in this pit. Um, compacting the soil that so uh, deep down underground there's the casing pipe uh, that we've talked about a number of different times and then um, um, and all the pipes going through so they're pulling sheet piles in the middle picture uh, and then um, on the right if you've been down to near South Bay and Quintana you'll know that they are working again on uh, the recycled water and water main relocations in that area a couple of really uh, again Anvil's moving quite a uh, quite along quite nicely we're, we're pleased with the progress that they've made since they uh since they got their new management team in place and um so you can see the pipes along the bike path and then the bridge abutment construction um pretty happy that this is proceeding uh on schedule with their uh plan <clears throat> it's pretty neat when you go out to the wharf these days as you can see here on the left uh, all of the pavement that's in place it actually is starting to look more like an actual treatment plant and less like a construction site uh, you can see the picture on the right of the paving uh, we're actually circulating uh, water through the plant, clean water through the plant to, to uh, test all the different equipment, test the treatment process as a whole, and to allow city operations staff to really start uh, playing in a sandbox without having actual uh, wastewater in the plant. But they uh, can test a number of different scenarios and, and um, run equipment as they want and um, uh, really uh, taking a, a challenging situation, which was the delay in the pipeline construction uh, and turning it to the city's advantage here. and, and um, really digging in and getting to know the plant really well. So pretty happy with the progress on uh, construction. Be glad to uh, take any questions at the end of the presentation on uh, any of the specific construction elements. As Dr Director Qualick said, uh, we have uh, four contract amendments in, ahead of you, or in front of you tonight. Obviously the Far Western and the Corolla amendments, um, no cost there, just sched simple schedule extensions. We can answer any questions or I can answer any questions after the presentation on those. And we'll spend some little bit of time on Cogstone and, and most of the time on the handbook. So Cogstone Resource Management. Uh, Cogstone currently oversees the archaeological and Native American monitoring during construction. It was an EIR requirement uh, that all ground disturbing activities, regardless of whether we're in disturbed soil or not, are monitored by Native American monitors to look for cultural resources. Um, and so <clears throat> the original base contract um, or the original contract included so many dig days, it was an, uh, uh, an analysis that was done on number of dig days, a number of crews that Anvil would have on site. Um, and because of Anvil's um, uh, schedule recovery, uh, Cogstone uh, ended up expending more days uh, than um, they originally intended. So we've had to amend their contract uh, a couple times and um, uh, this one extends this and gets us to the end of the contract. So um, this was estimated, and what we've done here is taken about $347,000 estimated based on their current Anvil's current schedule, um, counting up the number of dig days, assuming that uh, the Native American monitors and the Cogstone monitors would be on site during normal working hours, and, um, and then set a budget that was um, 
I don't know if I'd call it conservative, but it was a realistic budget based on what uh, Anvil was projecting in their schedule. The optional tasks are for additional dig days, for additional crews, should something go haywire with Anvil or, or uh, in, in that, or should there um, a bunch of overtime be needed if, um, say, for instance, the Atascadero Road pipeline installation goes a lot slower than anyone anticipated. So um, that's what those optional tasks are for a total of $390,000, dollars two hundred and seventy. Uh, dollars, and uh, this should complete the project. So our our aim is that we will not be coming back for any additional contract amendments for uh, Native American and cultural monitoring from Cogstone. Um, so our team did a pretty good job trying to estimate this uh, this work. So uh, next contract amendment again, Far Western. Uh, just for everybody, for anyone who doesn't know. Far Western really is more focused on the requirements from the programmatic agreement uh, between EPA and SHPO, and that is driven more by um, federal uh, environmental monitoring requirements than the EIR. Uh, Far Western has been part of our team since uh, probably mid-design, about 60% of the 60% um, uh, design on the conveyance facilities. They've conducted all of the investigations so far that were required by the programmatic agreement. They did the archeological clearance of the bridge abutments. They are currently working in the area along highway one um, to, to do the last clearing for the conveyance facilities uh, that's under contract at the moment. Um, and so they developed the, the monitoring mitigation reports. They have a great relationship with SHPO and with EPA, uh, really a top notch outfit and they, they really do a great job. Uh, in this case, what we're going to do with their contract, contract is extend it to 2025. Um, we're recommending to extend it to 2025, and that would be um, that would include uh, any future activities for archaeological investigation and clearance activities associated with recycled water. So it's, it's not just conveyance, but as we roll into recycled water, much of the same activities that have been conducted for um, the conveyance facilities will need to be done on the uh, recycled water facilities. And so this takes that um, their contract and it extends it. They've been underspending their contract actually from our original projection. So after the conveyance is done, we'll do a, uh, we'll take stock of, every, of where they are, uh, look at future scope items, and then there may be an, a future amendment to add money to their contract um, for additional monitoring, depending on what SHPO and EPA would require. But at this point, we're pretty optimistic about their contract that, um, that they're gonna have quite a bit of budget left. So um, we'll, we'll definitely come back and update you once they're done. Uh, I've already talked about Carollo and, and what we do. Um, and again, as Director Qualick said, we'll, we'll be uh, discussing work budget. Uh, you all will be discussing work, work budget on the 28th. Uh, we are in the process of getting a budget and um, scope in front of staff so that we can begin negotiating that. And we'd anticipate coming back uh, a little bit later this year to uh, uh, add money if that's what you all would like to do. And now for the um, uh, Anvil. Uh, contract amendment. So uh, as, as uh, Director Qualick said, there are seven items on this. I'll just start with the easy one, which is the generator re uh, requirements that had been rescinded uh, through some work that, uh, that um, one of the city's consultants did on uh, health risk assessments. Uh, Air Pollution Control District concluded that the additional California Air Resources Board requirements to bring those to tier four were not necessary. Um, for where the generators were located, their frequency of use, uh, et cetera. And so the health risk assessment uh, findings, uh, they agreed with that and concluded that those uh, modifications would not be noted. So we're getting a credit back from Anvil uh, for that particular one. So that's uh, that was a good win for the city on that particular uh, item. So for uh, just to run down the items, uh, it's in the staff report, so I won't, um, I won't belabor the details around any of these, but... Um, PCO 11, which was rerouting the IPR in the water line below uh, station 41, 144 culvert. Um, when this was originally potholed during design, uh, the potholing contractor thought that they had gotten the, um, the as-builts for this particular culvert did not show that it was a, an arched culvert. And so when the um, potholing contractor potholed it years ago, they, they just caught the edge of it. So it turned out it was actually a foot, foot and a half taller than what the pothole revealed or higher um, and so there was only going to be about a foot and a half a cover for these pipelines uh, over this particular culvert. So um, in this particular case, Anvil actually had to trench more, um, enlarge the trench. This is in an area that doesn't have great ground. Um, it was very slow going to get the IPR and water line under the, con uh, the culvert. 
the decision was made, you know, back in the day during design to try to go over the culvert to try to save money because we didn't, we thought the culvert was a, was buried a bit deeper, but it turned out that that, uh, that just wasn't possible with um, the amount of cover that would be over the new pipelines based on the shape of that culvert. Um, PCO 19, this is kind of an interesting story and I didn't get the full story until just recently. Um, this, this was part of an old desal facility that the city um, constructed 30 years ago that never really functioned the way it was intended. And so through time, city staff had disassembled the desalination facility. Um, and uh, the only remaining piece of that facility was this iron media tank that sits over by uh, the city's RO um, treatment facility, which treats groundwater. Um, and multiple contractors had actually looked at this uh, and, then act, and then declined to even give a quote for it. Uh, now that Anvil was on site and they're here, they've got crews, they've got equipment, they've got all the stuff here. We got a quote for um, this project for $54,189 to remove this iron media tank. Um, if anybody's walking by on uh, Tascadero Road, uh, there's four poly tanks that sit out front and it's kind of a hot dog shaped tank that, that's horizontal. Um, that's to remove that. Um, this was actually recommended in the One Water Plan and adopted by council. So uh, getting rid of this iron media tank would conclude the decommissioning of the desal facility and uh, get that project behind the city. So um, good quote on this. Um, I think there were multiple quotes that were received in the past and they were much, much higher. Um, PCO number 33, paving repairs near one, station 10250. This is over by Todd's Garage. Um, between the roundabout and and um, Kings, I believe is the next uh, street. That's just, it was poor pavement condition and during some wet weather, um, there was some caving in the trench and the paving. And so Anvil had to actually enlarge that trench and do a lot of pavement uh, stabilization and, and some additional work in that area and also slowed them down. Uh, 41 and 42 are related, uh, 26.6 for the unknown cementitious, cementitious subgrade on South Bay and then unknown conduits of South Bay and Quintana, um, 77.88 for those. Uh, 42 is just unknown, unmarked conduits uh, that were damaged and, and slowed Anvil down. They had to make repairs to the, those. I'm not really sure if uh, nothing was, was damaged significantly, but the conduits needed to be repaired. Um, and no utility owner ever came forward during USA to, to claim those. So they just put them back to the way that they found them and, and moved on. But it, co it cost them some time and some effort to get that done. And then the cementitious subgrade on South Bay slowed them down a lot. Um, I'm not sure exactly where that was. I think it's up by the Wharf um, site itself, but it slowed them down. And that's what this uh, change order was about. The uh, Vistra and pg e items, uh, number 49, this is a combination of a lot of different items, most of them related to the fact that uh, lift station two force main goes through Vistra property. Um, they didn't have a good records on their utilities. There were a lot of different utilities that were unmarked and unknown that they encountered, really slowed them down going through there. They had to make repairs. They had to do uh, a lot of work around this area. Um, and then even trying to get um, folks at Vistra that actually knew what these utilities were and, and where they, you know, where they went, uh, that was also difficult. So that cost Anvil quite a bit of time and effort dealing with some unmarked and unknown utilities on the Vistra property. And then one final item on this particular one, we all lumped them together, which was the uh, digging of a uh, test pit, an uh, infiltration pit for water that is produced during the um, during the uh, injection test well over near the so soil stockpile area in the temporary construction easement. Uh, Anvil did some investigatory work for us so that we would have a place to dispose of that production water during the uh, development of the injection well. So um, that I know I bruised through those pretty quick and so I'm glad to take questions, but end result here is we are recommending an amendment to uh, Anvil's contract that is actually a credit to the city for $54,000 and our $54,065, uh, including the $301,000 credit back to the city for the emergency generator requirements. So with that, I believe, oh, uh, and in the past, um, the staff report did include a contingency reallocation table that shows that in this case, we um, needed to actually move contingency budget around because we had exhausted contingency budgets for both the WERF and the conveyance facility. So we actually had to move 
con uh, contingency budget from the recycled water facilities to cover these uh, the conveyance amendments. So the table that was included in the staff report I've included here to show that the remaining construction contingency at the moment with the 144 million uh, budget number that we're currently carrying as of the last quarter of the report is uh, just shy of a quarter of a million dollars. So uh, that's the remaining contingency. Uh, and then you all will be considering a budget um, next council meeting uh, that we had presented a couple meetings ago. So now with that, I will take questions. Hey, thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. Uh, I'll go, ho go ahead and open it up for council questions. Good for hands. Council Member Heller, sir, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I have a question actually for uh, our city attorney. Uh, there have been some discussion, first of all, just kind of way about the, the piping portion of the project obviously has been extremely difficult and is a number of months behind completion of the plant. And it's possible that the contractor who built the plant will be charging the city for, for delays uh, in uh, Anvil being able to connect their piping to the plant. So uh, in the subcommittee uh, that I'm on with Mayor Heading, we've discussed various options. And I'm wondering, uh, Chris, if it's possible for you to address the issue of whether or not uh, the city has any recourse, uh, potential recourse against Anvil for delays that might have uh, exposed the city to damages from the builder of the plant. Can't hear you, Chris. Chris. Can't hear you. <laughs> can't hear you. We can see you. I hope it's not me, but <laughs> it looks like you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Is it your internet connection? No. Nope. Well, you can answer later, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that was my only question. Sorry about that, Council Member Hiller. We'll see That's if we can get him right. back. Sorry about that. Uh, Council Member Barton, yes, please. <laughs> Paul, I wanted to thank you again for um, such a good presentation. It's such a huge project and has so many moving parts to it. It's difficult to keep track of them all. And you have a good way of you know, pulling that stuff all in and laying it out in a way that people can understand it. So I, I greatly appreciate that. Plus the, the money left over at the end so far. So, <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> Thank you, Council Member Barton. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. You bet, Paul. Uh, other questions? And not, um, Chris, are you there? He's coming back. There you Recording are. Recording Can you all hear me now? We yeah. can. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I feel like one of those Verizon ads. Uh. Um, so, Councilman Heller, uh, I, I wouldn't want to prejudice the city's ability to uh, potentially uh, pursue any recovery against any of the contractors for some of the delays. Um, I uh, believe that the Wharf Subcommittee um, is a proper forum for us to discuss uh, further. Uh, my office, of course, has been reviewing, um, you know, these various issues uh, in consultation with staff and Carollo. And um, at this point, I, I wouldn't really want to comment at a public meeting on uh, possible options the city may have. I thought you might, but I had to ask. Thank you. <laughs> I thought that's what he might say, but <laughs> I thought so too. Yeah. Um, okay. Seeing no further questions, I'm going to go ahead and open up public comment. This is public comment for item C-3 in our agenda this evening. Public comment is now open. Thank you, Heather, for that. And um, Anthony, do we have any public comment, sir? All right, hey, thank you, Mayor. Currently, I do not see any raised hands in the queue. Hey, I'll close public comment, bring it back to council and either t uh, let's see entertain a motion or any further discussion that you may have um, looking for any hands okay all right well i i know that at the uh, subcommittee level we reviewed this in detail and i'm i'm glad to see the significant credit from the apcd after the health study that was done paul good work on that and 
good work with the subconsultants with regard to that. Um, and I feel that we've vetted the other uh, items um, uh, well, such that they're all um, appropriate with regard to our consideration. It's nice to see a total credit of 54K um, for a change um, based upon that one issue. But with that, I'll go ahead and recommend that we authorize the city manager to execute amendment number two to the agreement with Cogstone Resource Management for cultural resources monitoring uh, services during construction of the WRF lift station and offsite pipelines project for a total amount of 347,210 plus an additional $43,060 of optional <clears throat> as needed services for cultural resources monitoring as directed by the city's public works director resulting in a total not to exceed amount of $1,395,991.22 allocation of Cogstone amendment number two between uh, quarter four fiscal year 21-22 and quarter one fiscal year 22-23 is described in the fiscal impact section as noted in the staff report. And number two, amendment number seven to the agreement with Far Western um, Anthropological Research Group Incorporated to extend their contract expiration date to December 31st, 2025. Uh, number three, amendment number four to the agreement with Anvil Builders for the WRF lift stations and offsite pipelines construction for an overall reduction of $54,065, which provides a credit to their construction costs resulting in a new reduced total contract amount of $32,942,914. And number four, amendment number six, to the agreement with Corolla engineers to extend their contract expiration date to June 30th, 2023 which is non-compensable. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion by mayor heading for the staff report, second by council member Addis and any further uh, discussion? Okay. Heather, if we can do a roll call vote, please. Council member <laughs> Addis? Yes. Council member Ford? Yes. Council member Heller? No. Council Member Barton? Yes. Mayor Heading? Yes. Passes 401. Thank you. All right, that brings us to item D on our agenda this evening Council Declaration of Future Agenda Items. Anything for the greater good? Seeing none. All right, I'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Um, the next regular meeting of the City of Morro Bay City Council will be held on Tuesday, June 28th, 2022 at 5.30 p.m. at the Vets Hall in Morro Bay. Good to be uh, live again. Um, thank you all. Uh, thank you for the privilege every time and we will see you uh, at the next meeting. Have a great evening. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.